This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 313 of the program. Today is Friday, November 5th. Can you believe that the 2020 election took place a year ago, basically, as of today? That is just insane. But regardless, we've got a great show for you today. But before we get into that, I want to take some time to thank all of the people who make the show possible. All of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increase the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes Beacon23, Bruce Allen Ross, Joan Courtney, Cod Rimble, and Lokesh Pandya. Thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. We've got another jam-packed episode for you. We'll talk about what will likely be a disappointing end to the Build Back Better negotiations with progressives caving and Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema getting everything that they wanted. And we'll also discuss Bernie Sanders' last-ditch effort to try to make a difference with regard to Build Back Better. Also, Kirsten Cinema taunted activists that showed up to protest the wedding that she was officiating. Bill Maher declares that the pandemic is over. Mark Zuckerberg LARPs as a normal human being, but fails. Fox News' segment on critical race theory doesn't quite go as planned. Lauren Boebert broadcasts her stupidity to the world yet again. And QAnon cultists showed up in droves to welcome JFK Jr. back to society, even though he's been dead for decades. The fight to restore net neutrality might be stifled by, you guessed it, mansion and cinema. A new poll spells doom for American democracy. And we'll discuss the outcome of COP26 because that might spell doom for the planet. And we'll close out the program by talking to 2022 congressional candidate Imani Oakley. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today's episode. It's going to be another very long episode, but hopefully you enjoy what I have in store for you. Let's get to it. Well, Joe Manchin held a press conference and he essentially initiated a game of chicken with progressives. And it's very clear that they're backing down. Joe Manchin won. Progressives at this point have lost. And now it's a matter of how embarrassed they'll be in the end of this, which is still yet to be determined. Now, to give you some background before I show you what Joe Manchin said, progressives have, to their credit, remained committed to not supporting the bipartisan infrastructure deal unless they also vote on the Build Back Better Act, because they know that if they vote on the bipartisan infrastructure deal, which is a corporate handout that Joe Manchin and other Republicans want, then they have no leverage. They're not going to get the Build Back Better Act. So it's important that they remain committed, and they have. And Democratic Party leadership is getting increasingly impatient because they're going back on their promise to progressives, and now they're saying, "Mm, let's just vote on the bipartisan infrastructure, give the corporatists what they want, and then we'll revisit the Build Back Better Act later. In fact, over the weekend, Nancy Pelosi actually told members not to embarrass the president while he's overseas by voting against his bipartisan infrastructure deal because she's receiving pressure from the corporatists and they want to vote. And she now wants to give it to them because she thinks that they mean business. Progressives have absolutely no reason whatsoever to support the bipartisan infrastructure deal because it's it's useless. It's garbage. In fact, that alone does more harm to the planet overall. And AOC broke this down in a really insightful thread. And she says, passing BIF without Build Back Better makes our emissions and climate crisis worse. Sure, some BIF investments do good, but not enough. So it keeps us in the emissions red. So if progressives don't get a lot of concessions in Build Back Better, enough to offset the damage caused by BIF, bipartisan infrastructure, then they have no reason to support it. Vote it down. Now, the problem is that progressives aren't threatening to vote down the bipartisan infrastructure, and they're still kind of towing the same line, which was important to a point, but now it's not as valuable. So, for example, Jamal Bowman said, look, I'm a yes 
on both bills, but at the same time. He tweeted out, We passed what we ran on. I'm a yes to building back better for all. Both bills must pass. Now, I responded to that saying, Build back better is busted. Torpedo everything you got played. Don't give their corporate donors what they want. The crumbs you got in Build Back Better aren't worth voting on bipartisan infrastructure for. Don't be weak. Vote no. Tank it. Now, even though Jamal Bowman is in one way standing up to Nancy Pelosi by saying, no, I'm not going to vote on the bipartisan infrastructure yet. I want to vote on both bills. He's still caving by saying he's going to vote for Biff at all because it's it's a bad bill. And on top of that, Build Back Better got gutted. We talked about this last week. Paid leave was even, even removed. And you're still going to give them what they want? The bipartisan infrastructure proposal, which is a giveaway to their corporate donors? Fuck that. Vote it down. Don't give them what they want. You have no incentive now. There's not enough in Build Back Better. And by saying no, voting down both bills, you actually are showing the Democratic Party that you mean business. Why do you think Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer listen to these corporate Democrats? Why do you think they're encouraging you to vote on infrastructure? Because they know that these corporate Democrats, they mean business. They will vote down reconciliation. So to get both bills through, Nancy Pelosi is trying to appease the corporatists. But they're not trying to appease you. They kind of shut you out of negotiations on both Biff and Build Back Better because they know that at the end of the day, whatever they come up with, you're going to go along with it as long as there's a little bit of crumbs in it. So it doesn't matter how humiliated you look. So Joe Manchin, he held a press conference and he called their bluff. And he basically said, look, if we don't get a vote on bipartisan infrastructure, then I'm not going to support reconciliation. Here's what he had to say. Last week, the speaker urged, Speaker Pelosi urged the importance of voting and passing the Biff bill before the president took the world stage overseas and still no action. In my view, this is not how the United States Congress should operate or, in my view, has operated in the past. The political games have to stop. Twice now, the House has balked at the opportunity to send the Biff legislation to the president. As you've heard, there are some House Democrats who say they can't support this infrastructure package until they get my commitment on the reconciliation legislation. It is time to vote on the Biff bill, up or down, and then go home and explain to your constituents the decision you made. And I've always said, if I can't go home and explain it, I can't vote for it. And if I can, I, I will. I've worked in good faith for three months, for the past three months, with President Biden, Leader Schumer, Speaker Pelosi, and my colleagues on the reconciliation bill. And I will continue to do so. For the sake of the country, I urge the House to vote and pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Holding this bill hostage is not going to work in getting my support for rec reconciliation bill. Throughout the last three months, I've been straightforward about my con concerns that I will not support a reconciliation package that expands social programs and irresponsibly adds to our $29 trillion in national debt that no one seems to really care about or even talk about. Nor will I support a package that risks hurting American families suffering from historic inflation. Simply put, I will not support a bill that is this consequential without thoroughly understanding the impact that it'll have on our national debt, our economy, and most importantly, all of our American people. Every elected representative needs to know what they are voting for and the impact it has, not only on their constituents, but the entire country. So before I get to the response from the leader of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, Pramila Jayapal, I just want to go over some things that he said here. He said, I've worked in good faith for three months. Laughable absolutely laughable on top of that he says uh that he will uh not support a package that risks hurting american families suffering from historic inflation he would never be able to get away with that if we had a capable mainstream media that was doing its job because he doesn't care about the american people he doesn't care about what people in west virginia want if you look at the polls these policies are incredibly popular he's doing the bidding of his corporate overlords and on top of that, he says, this bill will irresponsibly add to our $29 trillion national debt that no one seems to really care about or even talk about. Yeah, that's because we shouldn't care about that. I don't give a fuck about the national debt and nobody who's serious should. I care about people in this country who are suffering because dipshits like you are holding your entire party back. Even when Democrats want to do the bare minimum, we can't even get that. 
can't even get a billionaire tax, can't even get four weeks paid leave, can't even join the rest of the world in offering the bare minimum to American workers. So look, if I'm a progressive and I see that, if I, if I see that he's very obviously trying to call my bluff, I'm saying, okay, keep your vote on reconciliation, Joe Manchin. We're voting no on your corporate handout disguised as bipartisan infrastructure. Fuck you. We don't need you. We're done with everything. We got nothing that we wanted. So we're going to deny you what you want so desperately for your donors too. But that's not what happened because Joe Manchin called the bluff of progressives in Congress and the leader of progressives back down. She basically said, well, look, <laughs> we, we really want to vote on both bills at the same time. But we're willing to vote for this bipartisan infrastructure corporate giveaway so long as the president pinky promises that we're going to get a vote on reconciliation. Take a look at what she had to say. This is just embarrassingly pathetic. You endorsed the White House framework last week, you as a group, of course. Are you confident that those two senators will be for it? Because they have been less than definitive in what they've said so far publicly. Yes, Andrea, it's good to see you. And we did endorse the framework. And in fact, we also had a very, very good meeting yesterday of the full CPC after the text was released, which is something that we were asking for, for the Build Back Better Act. And I'm very happy to say that we are now awaiting negotiations among senators on prescription drug pricing and child care and uh, some details on immigration but the Progressive Caucus, assuming good resolution of, of uh, those issues from the Senate side, that we will be excited to vote for both bills. We now feel like we have what we need. We are taking the president's word at um, the fact that he believes he can get 50 votes in the Senate. Um, and, you know, I hope that the two senators uh, that we've been waiting on these months um, who, who have come to the table in good faith and negotiated that they understand that this is a leap of faith, but uh, you know, assuming we get these these final negotiations done, we're ready to pass uh, both bills. And I think the caucus feels very good about the fact that we've been able to do what we said from the beginning, which is pass both bills at the same time, get the entirety of the president's agenda to his desk for signature and ultimately deliver transformative change for people across this country. That was absolutely pathetic. And this is why progressives don't get what they want. This is why they're not taken seriously during negotiations because of things like that. She said, we are taking the president's word at the fact that he believes he can get 50 votes in the Senate. And, you know, she really hopes that these two senators, Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, know that they're taking a leap of faith. That's assuming that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are good faith negotiators when Pramila Jayapal knows they are not. But what she's doing is she's buckling. And I'm going to play another clip for you in a moment where she talks about how, okay, even if the Build Back Better Act was gutted, what's in it is still good. But here's the problem with that. Uh, you're voting for what they want. So at that point, once you vote for their corporate giveaway, you no longer have leverage. So that $550 billion that's being made into climate change investments well, what's stopping Joe Manchin after you've given him infrastructure from saying, you know what, let's cut that in half. Let's also take out the uh, universal pre-K. Let's take that out too. If he does that, what are you going to say? No, you better not. You already gave him what he wanted. You gave away your leverage. So he can do anything he wants at this point. And you've enabled that. That's why, at a minimum, you can't vote for infrastructure unless you get a vote in the Senate on Build Back Better. And also, there was a little uh, line in there where she said she was waiting to see what happens in the Senate with regard to prescription drugs. Oh, you're just waiting and crossing your fingers that everything is going to go as you plan? You fight, Representative Jayapal. You fucking fight. It's not going to go your way if you just sit back and crush fingers and, and hope and pray that things are going to go your way. You're working against an entire industry that is trying to tank this. And it's clear that you've just decided to get steamrolled. What you said there is basically, give us whatever and we'll just go along with it because we have no fucking spines. Now, I do want to show you this um, second clip here where she made it very clear that she's she's happy with what's left of the Build Back Better Act. And um, yeah, they really hope that, um, you know, uh, the prescription drug clause is included in Build Back Better. But if it's not, I mean, we'll still vote for it. 
But there's a big if there. If you don't get Senate agreement on child care, immigration, pre prescription drugs, does that mean that you won't go forward? Well, I think that we are very, very close, um, is my understanding. And it isn't just the two senators at this point. They're, you know, you have to get 50 votes in the Senate. So there are different senators who are, um, who are pushing very hard for different pieces um, of this bill, including the prescription drug pricing piece. And um, on child care actually is really not about the overall, it's really about the implementation details. There are some differences between the language and what the Biden framework said. Um, so we are trying to iron out those differences. But my uh, my hope is that that will happen very quickly. And as I said, uh, you know, look, I think we're <laughs> we're in the very end zone here. We are we are just about to get this done, and we're feeling very good about uh, both bills. And and you know, and the president, frankly, being able to say once we deliver the Build Back Better Act, what a crucial time this is. You know, Boris Johnson talking about how important climate is. There's a $555 billion investment in climate. And we spent the weekend looking at whether it would really lead to significant reductions, meaningful reductions in climate emissions. And our belief, given the detailed look that we have had and the briefings we've had from the White House, that yes, we will get there with that. And so that is a huge victory. Um, and, and that's why we think you know, that we should pass these two bills together. Uh, as soon as possible. And let's wrap up these negotiations. Let's get these last things done and let's pass them through. I think we're ready. All right. So she claims that the reason why the main reason why progressives in Congress are still enthusiastic about Build Back Better is because of the 550 billion still in that bill for climate change investment. She says that we spent the weekend looking at whether it would lead to significant reductions, meaningful reductions in climate emissions. And our belief, given the detailed look, is that yes, we will get there. The problem is that, Pramila, even if you are excited about that provision, again, if you vote for infrastructure, Joe Manchin can say, I don't like that number, let's make it 100 billion. And there's nothing that you can do once you've given away your leverage. And furthermore, I don't believe that that's actually going to be sufficient. I mean, of course, I have to see the details of the bill. I'm sure it's positive. But when we're talking about global anthropogenic climate change, if you think that $550 billion is going to be sufficient, I just feel like that is incredibly naive. In an op-ed for the New York Times, Abram Lustgarden eloquently explains why even if progressives got the full $3.5 trillion uh, investments that they wanted, which, I mean, that's still the compromise, but even if they got that, that would still be not enough given the scale of the destruction that climate change will inevitably cause. He writes, the current price tag of nearly $1.9 trillion for climate and other social spending might seem enormous, though less so than the original $3.5 trillion plan, but over over the long term, either would be a pittance. By zeroing in on those numbers, the public debate seems to have skipped over the economic ramifications of climate change, which promise to be historically disruptive and enormously expensive. What we don't spend now will cost us much more later. The compromise plan calls for half a trillion dollars directed largely toward tax incentives for low emission energy sources, but it omits other provisions which will make it hard for Mr. Biden to reach his climate goals. Some economists and climate scientists have calculated that climate change could cost the United States the equivalent of nearly 4% of its gross domestic product a year by 2100. 4% is likely a conservative estimate. It leaves out consequential costs like damages from drought and climate migration. It assumes the United States and other nations eventually move away from energy generated by oil, coal, and natural gas, though not as immediately as many say is needed. In this scenario, the planet will still warm by around 3 degrees Celsius by the end of the century from pre-industrial levels, a change that would be disastrous. 4% of American GDP comes out to about $840 billion each year. It figured on last year's economic output. Measured over a decade, the way the Build Back Better Act is framed, it's nearly $8.4 trillion. But the actual cost of climate change to the economy could easily be far greater. So we know that half a trillion isn't enough to tackle climate change. But I guess if it meets Joe Biden's meager goals, then... Pramila Jayapal, as the leader of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, is satisfied. And it's just, it's incredibly disappointing to see how easily they will roll over for the corporate wing of the party. And you could even take things further. Okay, 
Build Back Better is gutted and they still really want you to vote for their infrastructure proposal, right? Because they want that gift to their corporate donors. There's a reason why over a dozen Republicans are supporting it in the Senate as well. So if they want that, make more demands from Joe Biden and say, look, you're clearly not going to get the votes. But if you assure us that you're going to be signing an executive order where you cancel 50000 in uh, student debt from each debt holder, if there's more executive orders that we can get from you before we vote on this, maybe we'll change our minds because what we're getting here is fucked over. We're getting crumbs and we don't accept it. But give us some more executive orders, these five executive orders, and sure, we'll, we'll consider a change of heart. We'll consider voting on your corporate giveaway if we get the crumbs and build back better. But they're not doing anything. They're, they're just rolling over and they're dying. And this is why they will never be taken seriously in Congress. Because at the end of the day, even when they do a good job and they hold strong for a really long time, you can always expect them to buckle. And this is why change never happens in the United States. It's really, really frustrating and it's disappointing. And honestly, if Pramila Jayapal doesn't think she can handle all of the pressure that leadership is putting on her, maybe she shouldn't be the leader of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Because what we saw is weakness. And you just broadcasted to everyone in the country that you're willing to go back on the bare minimum that you were holding strong on. So that's incredibly embarrassing. Congressional progressives look weak. And if progressives don't vote down everything, torpedo build back better and bipartisan infrastructure, I mean, they're, they're going to leave lots of young people who are hopeful that they'd get the job done feeling disillusioned. And that's going to hurt progressives in 2022. So if they let us down, they're going to be the ones to blame. I mean, Joe Manchin is clearly trying to play you, and you're giving him exactly what he wants. You walked right into his trap, and that's really unfortunate. Make some demands, fight, but they're not willing to fight. And unfortunately, I'm not that surprised. I kind of expected this to be the ultimate outcome. You know, when we were talking about all of these wonderful things in Build Back Better, I was pretty skeptical that they would be accomplished, and my cynicism unfortunately, was correct. So this is not really the surprising outcome so far, assuming it's going to head in this direction. It's just, you know, another day where progressives get fucked because they are absolutely spineless. And yeah, so Joe Manchin wins. Corporate America wins. All right, folks, so I have content that is both food for the soul, but it's also going to simultaneously crush your soul as well. Because what you're going to see is perhaps the most based protest of Kirsten Cinema yet, where protesters showed up to a wedding that she was officiating, and they're going to protest it. And that part is really, really cool. Her response, however, towards the end might send you into another doomer spiral. So you've been warned. Uh, nonetheless, take a look at what is an incredible protest. I know. I'm you are. Well, I, I really wish I could enjoy my wedding without you ruining it. I know you do. Could you just go down to that ladder for an hour? How about it's my daughter's wedding? Just for an hour. Just let her get married. Please. It's, okay. it's, this person is not my daughter. My daughter is getting married. Tell, will you tell her that? Did, did you yes. invite Senator? Really I don't here? know. You listen. Tell her I, that we don't like what really she's doing to our country. I'm not too much like this. You know what? Tell her. Tell her. I I don't disagree with any of you people when you're going to do it. Your rights. It's my daughter's wedding. 
please, blow her out. Please just go down to the corner for one hour. Please. It's my daughter's Shay. wedding. Shay. Just one hour. Shay. Could you Shay. Please. Please. Shay. 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 Okay. They'll be quiet. Whoa. They have a right to protest. Stop talking to them. They'll let her go back in and play with her millionaires. I mean, I fought for your fucking right to protest. Woo! Thank well, you. So you go back inside. You're a millionaire, buddy. Come on now, our future's at stake. Everything's on the line. And you're letting this woman get away with it. I'm tired of this shit. Stop taking corporate money. Total corruption of our government. Total sellout. Totally unacceptable. Totally unacceptable for you to support it. Yeah, keep laughing. Keep laughing. I'm an Ivy League educated white old man. And I've been destroyed by this economy. And that corruption stems from corporate power. And cinema is taking corporate money to destroy us all. And climate will do it without her. So wake up! Woo! Woo! Why don't you get married to Donald Trump? Yeah! Okay, everything about that was incredible. These protesters are absolutely just amazing. I really respect them for doing this. But at the end, when they got footage of her inside the wedding, when she noticed them, she spotted the camera and she was taunting the protesters looking at the camera as she was singing that right there it just it made me lose so much more hope because it's clear that even if these direct action oriented efforts to influence her are important they're not working and she's kind of throwing that in your face that there's nothing you can do i don't care protest me protest me everywhere i go it doesn't matter not gonna change my opinion eat shit peasants it it's just, you know, what do you do in that point? What do you do? Electoralism is this slow process, and she might not even want to run for re-election, so you can't have the satisfaction of beating her in, the, in a primary. Directly protesting her isn't having an impact, so people, I mean, they see this and they want to check out of the system. And honestly, if, if it were taking place virtually, if that wedding were occurring in, say, Roblox, I don't think that those protesters would have been out of line to just straight up fling dog shit over the fence and try to hit Kirsten Cinema with it. Of course, in a video game, not in real life. I would never condone that or endorse that. But if this were taking place in Roblox, I think just throwing shit at these elites, that would have been the best course of action. I mean, what do you do? What else do you do? We're, we're suffering. We lost. We get nothing that we want. So at least we can get the satisfaction of making sure that we irritate these elitist pricks as much as we want. And... The bride here who approached these protesters, if she were a reasonable person and wasn't an elitist prick, she would try to level with the protesters. She would say, look, I understand how this looks. There's a bunch of people getting married and we have this senator who's blocking things that would save lives in America. I, I get the way that this looks. Here's what I'll do. If you stop protesting, I'll ask her to leave. We'll find a different officiant. I mean, she could have done that, but what does she do? She condescendingly walks up to these people and she says, uh, hi. Thanks for ruining uh, my, my wedding. I really appreciate it. She also says, I wish I could enjoy my wedding without you ruining it. So someone like this, someone who is getting Kirsten Cinema to officiate their wedding, I don't know much about this bride. She's not the person who I'm angry with here, but I just have to assume that if you want someone like Kirsten Cinema or really any politician to officiate your, your wedding, you're just a shitty person in general and you kind of deserve your wedding to be ruined. Now, the mom walked out and was begging and pleading with the protesters, so clearly it was affecting them. And, you know, rather than asking Kirsten Cinema to leave because you could just find a new fucking officiant, well, they actually complied. They listened. They said, you know, we'll, uh, we'll shut up. And afterwards, after the protesters were respectful enough to be quiet as the ceremony proceeded. What do they do later? They're dancing and acting all high and mighty and condescendingly, you know, just taunting the protesters. It's just, it's despicable. And the people who were conversing with the mother, 
they asked some really important questions. Why would you invite this woman? She's ruining our whole country. Kick her out. Kick her the fuck out. Why would you want Kirsten Cinema here? I mean, this is an elitist wedding. It's a circle jerk with powerful people, I'm assuming. You have a senator there to officiate the wedding. It's just everything about this. It really is discouraging. And I'm going to make you even more doomer because Fox News picked up on the story. And of course, they portrayed these protesters negatively. They clutched their pearls that protesters would dare to ruin this wedding. And Fox News then linked to the video. So if you go to the video and you see this on YouTube, well, Fox News viewers ratioed these protesters who did a public service, but yet they were ratioed. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to that video's page. I will link to it down below if you're watching this on YouTube. And I want you to out-ratio Fox News' audience and give these protesters a like, at least the person who uploaded this footage. Because what they did was a public service, and I feel bad that they had to turn off the comments because they got bombarded by Fox News boomers who were clutching their pearls at these protesters who dared to protest a, win a wedding where this elitist prick is the officiant. But look, here's the thing. It may not be working, right? These protests where people go up to Kirsten Cinema and they confront her in public, it may not be working. It's not going to get her to change her opinion. Having said that, though, it's still really important because at a minimum, you know that it's inconvenient. At a minimum, you know, even if she's not letting it on, it's getting under her skin. So if these politicians aren't going to listen to you, regardless of what you do, the best thing you can do is take satisfaction knowing that you're irritating them. That's honestly sad. It's a pretty uh, grim takeaway. This is bleak shit, I know. But still, Kirsten Cinema, with what she's been doing, to the extent to which she's sold out, she should never be able to show her disgustingly pathetic face in public again. Everywhere she goes, she should be protested. Nobody should want her to officiate their wedding. Nobody should want her to be around because they know that that's going to come with protesters. Every single time Kirsten Cinema leaves her house, she should expect protesters. And it might not face her. She might become desensitized to it. Don't care. So long as we can at least minorly inconvenience her, I think it's the bare minimum that we can do to make these elites pay. If they're not going to listen to us, then at least give them hell. They don't listen. Oh, well, at least we're making their lives a little bit miserable. Not as miserable as they're making our lives, but at least it's it's something, right? So fuck Kirsten Cinema. Fuck this wedding. Uh, fuck these elites, fuck the mom who was crying, fuck the bride, fuck the groom, fuck all of these people. I hate all of these people. This is a shitty country with shitty politicians who are ruining our lives. I mean, don't clutch your pearls at the wedding. Clutch your pearls at the people who are suffering because of corporate sellouts like Kirsten Cinema. So when it comes to daily COVID-19 cases, we're thankfully in a much better place now than we were a couple of months ago, but we still aren't out of the woods yet. We don't know how bad it's going to get over the holidays, and as it gets more colder, people are going to congregate indoors. Yes, we do have more people vaccinated this year, but also we have the Delta variant, which wasn't a thing during the last holiday season. So it's not over yet, and we're still averaging more than 70,000 new cases per day. And I think that a lot of us acknowledge this probably isn't going to go away anytime soon. In fact, epidemiologists are predicting that COVID-19 isn't really just going to go away. It's not like we're going to declare the pandemic over and then all of a sudden we get back to normal. This is most likely going to become something that's endemic, which means we have like COVID seasons every year. But I mean, we, we can't really predict that. But what we do know with certainty is that it's not all good yet. But somebody who uh, apparently knows more than all of us, Bill Maher, is going to share some good news with all of us. The pandemic is over. And it's over not necessarily because we're at a better place, but because Bill Maher, non-expert, is unilaterally declaring the pandemic is over. I don't know that the virus got the message, but nonetheless, Bill Maher is very confident that things should return to normal and that Republicans who haven't done anything to try to mitigate the spread of the virus, they're actually the ones who are handling this the best. So I don't have a clip, but I do have an article from Mediaite where they share his idiotic remarks. Caleb Howe writes, during Friday's real time, Bill Maher stated more than once that the pandemic is over, insisting that masks are no longer necessary and arguing that red states are better on COVID policy. At one point, 
Marr told Senator Chris Coons that it's the Democrats who are to blame for pandemic measures that lasted longer than necessary. Just resume living, Marr said as they began the panel discussion, saying that he hopes Dr. Anthony Fauci told everyone to go ahead with Halloween. Marr and Coons were joined by Atlantic writer Caitlin Flanagan, who generally agreed with Marr's take on the pandemic measures. I mean, come on, 15 of 100,000? That's where we are, cases in California, 15 cases per 100,000 people? I know some people seem to not want to give up on the wonderful pandemic, but you know what? It's over. There's always going to be a variant. You shouldn't have to wear masks, said Marr. I haven't had a meeting with my staff since March of 2020. Why? But... Really, I mean, also, vaccine, mask, pick one. You gotta pick. You can't make me mask if I've had the vaccine, he said to a big applause from the audience. He asked Coons whether he is down with that because it's the Democrats who are mostly keeping these rules in place. I mean, I travel in every state now back. I'm back on the road and the red states are a joy and the blue states are a pain in the ass for no reason, he said. Coons answered that everybody should get vaccines and that even though people are tired of strict controls on their lives, the world isn't safe until the world is vaccinated. Now, what Chris Coons said there, as much as I disagree with him on everything else, is correct. We have to make sure that these other countries have the vaccine. And until they get the vaccine, this isn't going to be over anytime soon. So that's priority number one. But in terms of what Bill Maher says, uh, I'm going to be extra kind to him in one way and in another way i'm going to make fun of him because you don't get to just declare that the pandemic is over because you're frustrated we're all fucking frustrated with the pandemic i get it but facts don't care about your feelings even if we're feeling frustrated you don't just get to say i'm done with it no more rules i mean okay that would be lovely in theory but it's still very much going on a thousand people are dying every single day in fact on the day after uh, Bill Maher made this comments, or the day before Bill Maher made these comments, rather, 2,000 Americans died. We're having almost the 9-11 every single day. So to just say, it's over, let's get back to normal, that's pretty irresponsible and callous for the people who are still suffering. But I will say that to his point, that look, I've been vaccinated. For people who have done everything that they've needed to, to do, yeah, I do think that there should be more freedoms for them, right? If you've done everything, you've gotten the vaccine, I think that your life should be somewhat normal. I think that indoor spaces should cater to people who have done their part. So if, you know, you want to feel safe and go to a movie theater by being around vaccinated people and you can show proof of that, I think that's permissible. I think that's acceptable. But the problem is that in America, you know, you, you can't really do anything, at least effectively, without anti-vax babies uh, ruining it for everyone. So back in, what was it, May, uh, when the CDC kind of got rid of the mask mandates and they went off of the honor system. Well, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. Well, obviously, people who were not vaccinated, they also just stopped wearing masks too. And then the Delta variant hit and then our cases were skyrocketing. So you can't just do that. There has to be some protocols. And I think that you can make the lives of people who are vaccinated easier by allowing them, them to like download some app on their phone and say, look, I've been vaccinated. I think I should be allowed to go indoors without wearing a mask. I, I think that that's fine because there are studies that show that even if vaccinated people still do uh, spread COVID, if they are infected, they spread it at a much lower rate than unvaccinated people. And that's if vaccinated people even get the virus. So uh, I do agree with him that sure, vaccinated people, people who have done what they need to do, who are responsible citizens, they should have more freedoms. But to just overall go back to normal, I mean, that would be catastrophic at this point in time. At least wait and see where we're at in February after the holidays. But look, I, I don't want to be too down on him because I do get the frustration. I'm extremely frustrated. It feels like this is never going to end. And sure, COVID-19 might not go away. It might just become something different. It might be endemic. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be this bad. If we were in such a terrible country and we actually did the bare minimum to try to mitigate the spread, and if we paid people to stay home, and if Americans weren't dumber than other citizens in other countries, then it wouldn't be this bad. But it is bad because in America, we're entitled little pricks. And if you tell us to mask up, we throw temper tantrums. If you tell us that we need to get vaccinated, we throw temper tantrums. There were conversations 
that uh, our parents were probably having and grandparents were having when it comes to seatbelt laws. Oh, well, I, I'm not going to wear a seatbelt. This is authoritarianism. I'm going to avoid all the states that require me to wear a seatbelt. Well, every state, uh, every state has seatbelt laws and it's no longer viewed as authoritarianism. Same thing with smoking. Oh, what? There's a smoking section? We're being segregated? This is like racism now, but for people who smoke, this is disgusting. What? I can't smoke on a plane? Yeah, now you can't smoke indoors. Everyone just widely accepts that that's a thing, and all of a sudden, it's not authoritarianism. And I think that the vaccine mandates will be viewed in that way in the future. But it's just every single thing that we could be doing we're not we're not doing it. I mean, when other countries go into lockdown, they really go into lockdown. They don't do it in a half-assed way. So in the United States, we've made this situation worse for ourselves because we're so stupid and also because we have a government that is just fundamentally broken and incapable of doing anything to be effective. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the pandemic being over, I wish that were the case, but it's not the case. And we don't just get to go back to normal, unfortunately, if Bill Maher is tired of this, you have a gigantic mansion that probably has like 25 bedrooms. Go play in it. Go in your personal bowling alley or your indoor swimming pool and shut the fuck up. It's the real people who have to work with people during a pandemic, who have to work with the public. They're the ones who are suffering. So spare me your frustration. I get it. We're all frustrated, but it's not over yet. And I want it to be over, but that's not the way that it works. We don't get to just throw temper tantrums and get our way when we're adults. We should learn this by now. But, um... That's where we're at. This is the American mentality, and Bill Maher isn't an exception to the rule. He's just kind of uh, saying what everyone else is saying. But, I mean, yeah, we're all fucking frustrated, Bill, but it's still a thing. It's not over yet, unfortunately. I want it to be over, but me wanting it doesn't make it a reality. I also would like to be six foot five inches tall. I also would like to fucking have, I don't know, Elden Ring now. I would also like to have a fucking flying car. But we don't get what we want simply by throwing a temper tantrum. That's not the way that the world works. So I'll, I'll leave that there. I mean, it's Bill Maher, so nobody should be that surprised with him. Again, like, I understand the frustration on a human level, but at the same time, shut the fuck up, Bill Maher. I mean, Jesus Christ, he's so insufferable, and I can't take it. Okay, so I have to apologize to my viewers in advance. This is incredibly petty, perhaps the most petty video that I've ever released, but I have to comment on this. So Mark Zuckerberg, he just changed the name of Facebook's parent company to Meta, and they did this really cringeworthy press conference, but one moment really stood out to me where he had a conversation with someone who I believe is a developer for virtual reality applications and video games, and the conversation that they have is so, uh, I don't know how to explain it. It's so fucking weird that I don't think it's hyperbole to say that Mark Zuckerberg has never had a conversation with a normal human being. And this is evident in the way that he talks, the way that they use hand gestures in this overly exaggerated, really excited way. There's too many points. This is fucking strange. I, I, I don't know what to say. So I'm going to mute myself and we're going to watch it uh, together. Uh, and I'll, I'll put the the good audio over over this here so we can kind of see. But just just take a look, pay attention to the hand gestures. This is so fucking weird. Keep creating. Now, Deb from our studios team is joining me. Deb, do you want to take us through some of the exciting games in the pipeline for Quest? Absolutely. Over the years, we've had the opportunity to work with incredible developers like Vertigo Games, the studio behind fan favorite Arizona Sunshine. Oh, I love Arizona Sunshine. That game basically got me and my friends through the first few months of the pandemic. Absolutely. <laughs> like, what? I love Arizona Sunshine. That game get, basically got me and my friends through the first couple of months of the pandemic. Who talks like this? Who has conversations like this? This is not how normal people talk. This is so fucking weird. That's awesome. That's awesome. If you awesome. enjoy that, Mark, I think you'll be excited that we're partnering with Vertigo on five more great games. On five. From Deep Silver and others. We'll share more about this lineup very soon. Nice. What else is coming? Well... The metaverse is constantly evolving, so one of the most important aspects will be live service games that launch updates and new downloadable content regularly, like Echo VR, Beat Saber, <laughs> Onward, Pistol Whip, and more. We're focused on this a lot right now, making sure games can build out active communities. Beat Saber has a passionate community. Oh, I love Beat Saber. So do I. And Beat Saber just passed $100 million in lifetime revenue on Quest alone, 
It's a great example of a game that keeps releasing fresh content. They've actually been working on evolving the way that you interact with the tracks and feel the music. Also, the team has been working on something really cool. Check this out. Wow. I can't wait to play this. And they keep partnering with incredible artists to release new music packs all the time. Did you play the Billie Eilish music pack last month? A little more than I should have. I probably should have been working more on this metaverse presentation. <laughs> well, they have a great lineup of artists for 2022. And there's one more epic surprise before the end of the year. So stay tuned. Okay. Have you played Population One? I mean, yeah, I love the game well, so much. That for those who haven't, Population One is a thrilling battle royale that is only possible. Can't do any more. <sighs> I don't know what it is about this clip in particular, but it really makes me want to kill myself. That's awesome. In Roblox, of course. And I just love how he's like, "Oh, I played the Billy Eyelash." Beat Saber upgrade. <laughs> I love his music. Billy's a good guy. I actually know Billy myself. I mean, this is so strange. And the way that she's like, well, there's five new tracks, everyone. This is this is why America is so fucked up. Absolutely. Because these corporate dumb fucks, they're the ones who control everything. They control politics. They control every fucking aspect of our lives. We are living in a late stage capitalist dystopian hell. And these are are our overlords. These absolute fucking clown dipshits who don't even talk to normal people. Well, let me tell you about Beat Saber and this all new really hip track. Ha <laughs> ha, raise the roof. I just, this shit, honestly, it makes me root for climate change. Like it makes me want human beings to go extinct at some point. Like I think that, <laughs> just, this, this shit, honestly, I don't know what the fuck it is about this. It, it puts me in such a dark place because, uh, and look, I'm overreacting. I'm being way too dramatic, but this is so fucking weird. And it just, it, it, these are the people who have control in American society. These weirdos, these fucking androids i mean look i told you that this wasn't going to be substantive but i i i don't know what the fuck to say that is just this is too weird anyone who sees this if you don't get nauseated from watching that you're not a real person you're you're weird i think you're the one with the problem not me for overreacting to this i think that if you see that and you think everything is perfectly copacetic it's all normal i think that you're the one with the problem because normal people don't talk like that I love Beat Saber. I love Arizona Sunshine. It's what helped me and my friends get through the pandemic. Motherfucker, you probably have never played any video game a day in your life. During the pandemic, you and your friends were like, I don't know, swimming in your indoor pool in your mansion. Uh, you, you were doing weird shit, probably drinking the blood of, of children. I, I don't want to, like, dog whistle to conspiracy theorists I'm, I'm being facetious here but i just feel like you know th these people are so detached and they try to hype up this uh product that they're selling with their fake enthusiasm and it's just it's so disingenuous it's so scripted you can have a conversation with someone and just it doesn't have to be scripted not everything has to be manufactured and scripted but this is uh this is the dystopian society that we're living in again i'm just rambling at this point but I just, I want you to see this video and I hope it makes you suffer as much as it makes me suffer because I can't unsee this. And there's something about this video that broke me, but um, yeah, that's, that's it. I've said this once, I'll say it again. The Build Back Better Act is busted, but there are people like Bernie Sanders who actually genuinely care about working people in this country and he's making one last ditch effort to try and convince his colleagues to support the one thing that lots of people really want. And that is an expansion of Medicare to include dental and vision. Now, Bernie Sanders knows that these corporate ghouls, they don't care about anything but delivering for their corporate overlords. But if he can get them to at least think about this in terms of their own re-election campaigns, if you deliver 
a policy that's extremely popular, at least out of self-interest, consider supporting it. And that's what he tried to do. That's the appeal that he made. And as HuffPost reporter Igor Bobek tweeted out, overheard on the floor, Bernie Sanders showing colleagues a morning consult poll on his phone of the most popular provisions falling out of Build Back Better. So we drop what's most popular, he asks, referencing the Medicare expansion. Now to him, this is what he cares the most about. This has kind of been something that he views as a red line. You can't take this out. He knows that we're not going to get Medicare for all in the near future. But if we can expand Medicare, that is a really important step. Because if you don't get Medicare for all, for all passed all at once, then you just keep further expanding and expanding. You get the ball rolling. You expand benefits to more people, uh, include more things in it. And eventually, perhaps, we arrive at a situation where actually going the full distance, giving everyone health care is a little bit easier. So this is his pet project. And he's trying to convince these imbeciles that, look, it's not about anything but you. The American people want this. So imagine taking this back to your constituents. Look how popular this is. And he's right about that. I mean, if you look at that poll from Morning Consult, well, it's obvious. They report Democrats dropped Medicare, dental, and vision coverage from their social spending bill. Voters say it's their top priority. Healthcare measures are the most popular among 18 provisions that were considered for the Build Back Better plan. So let's look at this poll here. Not only is the Medicare expansion uh, to include dental and vision popular, but it's the most popular provision. So voters said the following measures were among their top five priorities in Build Back Better. And as you can see, adding dental and vision to Medicare is one of the top priorities with 41% of voters saying that this is one of the most important issues. And then you have Medicare adding hearing as the fourth most popular with 25% of people saying that this is one of their top five priorities. You also see this trend of healthcare related policies as top priorities for Americans. Funding elder care, allowing Medicare to negotiate prescription drugs. I mean, this is a trend. Now, if you look at this poll, what's interesting is that even more Republicans want the Medicare expansion than Democrats, at least as it relates to dental and vision. So this whole excuse that you have to be a moderate in purple states like Arizona or red states like West Virginia, it's just not true because Republican voters want this more than Democratic Party voters, according to this poll. So it's to the point where Bernie Sanders is basically begging and pleading with them out of your self-interest, deliver. This is popular. And it seems unlikely that they're going to budge. It just seems like the Democratic Party is a black hole that is collapsing in on itself. Um, and it's thanks to corporate ghouls like Joe Manchin, Kirsten Sinema, and also other corporate Democrats like Mark Warner and Joe Biden himself. Now, Bernie Sanders tweeted out that same poll that we just looked at, and he said, when 41% of the American people tell us that their top priority is for us to expand Medicare to include dental and vision benefits, one of the most popular items in the Build Back Better agenda, what should we do? We should listen to the people. Let's get this done. And look, as frustrated as I am with these negotiations, I've got to give Bernie Sanders credit. He is trying really hard. And ultimately, I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know if he's going to end up caving. But at least you see that effort from him. You see him trying to do the best that he can to include as much as he possibly can with his limited amount of um, of votes that he has. So it's, it's frustrating. And even when Democrats try to do something good, it's always a watered down half measure that's usually just intended to placate voters. So uh, an example of that is Chuck Schumer announced that they've reached an agreement when it comes to Medicare negotiating prescription drug prices. The problem is that it is woefully inadequate, predictably. So the agreement would allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices in limited instances, prevent drug companies from raising prices faster than inflation, and cap out-of-pocket costs for seniors on Medicare at $2,000 per year. Also, Medicare could negotiate up to 10 drugs in 2025 and up to 20 drugs in 2028 and beyond, according to the summary which The Hill obtained. That's just embarrassing. Now, the good thing is that insulin copays would be capped at $35 per month, and that sounds great. I mean, I'd prefer it to be $0, but $35 is preferable to $400. But what's, what's the catch? Is this going to take effect in five years, 10 years? I mean, allowing Medicare to negotiate 10 drugs by 2025, that's just bad politics. 
Because by then, there may be a completely different administration. A Republican might be in power. And when people finally feel the effects of this policy, the Republican can then take credit for it. And it's not like there's a lot. Ten drugs? Out of the thousands of drugs, you're only going to allow them to negotiate ten by 2025? It's just, it's so frustrating and pathetic. And on top of that... So Medicare won't be able to negotiate drugs until they no longer have exclusivity. Got to make sure that these pharmaceutical giants can make as much money as possible. And um, most negotiations will be allowed for many drugs. I don't know what many means. After nine years, and then more drugs will be uh, negotiated in 12 years. So it's like they take a half measure. They water that down, cut that in half. By the time you get the actual product... It's a tenth of what it was. It's just, it's laughable. And what we see here is Bernie Sanders just trying. Perhaps he's trying to appeal to their self-interest, but also maybe appeal to their humanity. But the thing is that these ghouls, they have no humanity. These are soulless clowns who care about one thing, and that is appeasing their donors. So I, I just don't know what to say. I really am thankful that Bernie Sanders is fighting but unfortunately, it's not enough. We don't have enough Bernie-minded people in power. And as a result, the Kristen, uh, Kirsten Sinemas and Joe Manchins of the world, they, uh, they get what they want, whereas progressives get left in the dust. And sometimes these are self-imposed wounds. Like, I I've talked about how progressives under the leadership of Pramil Pramila Jayapal, they're so feckless, so ineffectual, so weak, even when they have victories, they end up caving. All it takes is one demand from a corporate Democrat. So it's just, the situation is really, it's helpless. And I can't not think about how bad it's going to be in 2022 when Democrats are absolutely obliterated. And then what? You didn't get anything meaningfully accomplished. You didn't do voting rights reform. You didn't end gerrymandering. You didn't even try to fix our democracy. The Supreme Court wasn't even touched. They have a supermajority for conservatives. How bad is it going to get before Democrats actually do what's needed to do to fix this country? And the answer is, there is no bottom. It's just going to keep getting worse and worse because they just don't give a shit. And, you know, I, I don't know what to say about that. I wish that I could offer you some rosy takeaway from this, but the situation is just, it's, it's really depressing. And at least we have Bernie there fighting for us, but Bernie Sanders is in his 80s. He should be retiring by now. But... He's all we have, at least in the Senate, who's fighting this hard. I mean, we have some people who from time to time do the right thing in the Senate. We have more progressives in the House. But overall, things aren't changing fast enough. And we're circling the drain as a country. And I think that most people can see that that's apparent. I haven't talked about the Virginia gubernatorial race on this program, but it's really fascinating how somehow critical race theory was one of the key issues that was a deciding factor in this race. And even though the Chud Republican, uh, Glenn Youngkin, who was running against the corporate Democrat, Terry McAuliffe, ran a substance-free campaign, he still managed to win all by working Virginia voters up into a frenzy over just nonsensical things. So it's really sad that there's all these issues in America that need to be fixed. And I'm sure there's many issues specific to Virginia that need to be addressed. But yet what it came down to was nonsense, like critical race theory and how it's bad. And that's depressing to me because I see that voters by and large, they do side with progressives. They agree with us on the policy substance. But they can very easily be manipulated by individuals who get them to think that these culture war issues are more salient than the issues that affect them directly. And it's not even like they have good reason to be against critical race theory, because a lot of them don't even know what it is. Case in point. What's the most important issue in the governor's race here in Virginia? Getting back to the basics of teaching children, not teaching them critical race theory. And, uh, and, and what is critical race theory? Well, I'm not going to get into the specifics of it because I don't understand it that much, but it's something that I don't, the, what little bit that I know I don't care for. And, and what have you heard that, that you don't, well, that you I'm don't not, like? Well, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't have that much knowledge on it. 
but it's something that I'm not, that I don't care for. Now I get it, that's anecdotal evidence, but I think that that man represents a broader issue here. Republican voters, they don't necessarily know what critical race theory is, they just know it's really bad because Republicans told them it's bad. So the way that Republican media and Republican politicians are able to whip their voters into a frenzy, I mean, it, it's soul crushing, right? And that's not to say that Terry McAuliffe throughout the course of the campaign was promising voters anything because, I mean, this is someone who was already the governor. I was rooting for Lee Carter during the Democratic Party primary. And Terry McAuliffe offers voters nothing. But still, I mean, to just say critical race theory bad, and this is a bit reductionist, right? That's not the totality of Glenn Youngkin's campaign, but Republicans, by and large, they're not offering any response to the problems. They're creating problems. They're manufacturing issues that don't exist, and they're actually effectively getting voters to focus on that more. Now, the good news, however, is that sometimes fear-mongering about critical race theory doesn't always go as planned, and I do want to share a clip from Fox News. So they talked to two voters on the day of the election, one McCullough voter, one Youngkin voter, and the issue of critical race theory came up, and what you're going to see is a voter just easily dismantle it, effortlessly dismantle that entire narrative, and the Fox News host very clearly didn't know how to respond to that. So enjoy, because this was a really great clip. Within a short period of time, uh, we started hearing more about this thing called critical race theory, which I had never heard about. Um, and um, after some investigation, uh, some FOIA requests that I've started seeing on the news, uh, a lot of taxpayer money, my taxpayer money, our taxpayer money, um, had been invested in some teacher training uh, and that would be enrolled or rolled into the student curriculum that I didn't agree with. A lot of it looked off, not only off, but it looked like uh, it bothered me. It was controversial. There was aspects of it that looked downright racist. And so I had a hard time um, with that. And the other aspect is, um, I know uh, Glenn Youngkin um, has campaigned all along to push the VDOE or the Department of Education to uh, keep the, um, the higher standards. Because I mentioned when we were, uh, we saw the window into the children's education when they were home for so long, um, we did notice, we started seeing, um, uh, do your kids want a pass-fail option as opposed to a letter grade? Your child can't fail now this year because of COVID. And I did not see a lot of learning going on, and that greatly concerned me. Yeah. I think there was a lot of learning loss uh, over the past year and a half. We all saw um, with the kids at home and um, a lot of these options that you can get through the class with just a pass or a fail um, and some of the measures that have sort of watered down uh, the standards in not just in Virginia, many places. But um, Mara and Brooke, thank you very much. It's can great I say to one thing? Yeah, though, absolutely. About, I don't think people necessarily uh, truly understand what critical race theory is. Younger children are not being taught critical race theory. They can't understand critical race theory. They're being taught history. So when somebody here in Loudoun County, I understand, was upset that his second grade child was taught that Christopher Columbus um, killed many indigenous people, that's part of history. That is what Christopher Columbus did. So I have a hard time. I think Kids have to learn history, the good, the bad, the ugly, so they can become critical I don't think anybody's against that. I think we have thinkers. to we do a fact check on the Christopher Columbus story as well. But, um, uh, you know, it, critical race theory, I think, sometimes is a little bit of a misnomer because what, what's happening is that there's a sort of a reformed thinking and approach to history that teaches that the country was founded in racism. You can say critical race theory is like a legal theory that is found more in colleges. Um, so maybe giving it that label has, has thrown some people off. But it doesn't mean that there's not things being taught that are teaching kids that they're sort of inherently, um, you know, victims or oppressors. I um, think we'll have to so. agree to disagree on that because right. I have a different thoughts and feelings. Okay. On that. So you heard that right. The Fox News host actually said, uh, I think we have to do a fact check on the Christopher Columbus story as well. Well, I'll do that for you. I'll save you the time. It's true. Christopher Columbus slaughtered indigenous people. The fact that you need to fact check that shows how stupid you are.
But this clip kind of gives me hope amid the doomerism that I'm feeling because it's not very difficult to dismantle that right-wing narrative. Now, they are more effective at broadcasting their message because they have money on their side. But when they're actually challenged, even minimally, by average voters, they, they don't know what to do. They have to fact check whether or not it's true that Christopher Columbus slaughtered indigenous people. So these people are not bright. They're good at one thing, and that's marketing. So we're good at convincing people that the policies that we want them to support are ones that they should support. The issue that we are losing uh, with regard to voters is we can't effectively change the salience of these issues. So while we might get voters to agree with us that Medicare for all is good and expanding you know, the social safety net is good, they may they might agree with us, but they don't rank that very high on their list of priorities. Republicans can come in with some bogus narrative, critical race theory, cancel culture, and automatically they view that as more important. So I don't know what it is that we have to do. Maybe we need a more effective left-wing media machine. Maybe we need to be more bombastic and hysterical in the way that we talk about politics, but at least we know what we're lacking. And it's at getting people to agree with us that the issues we care about are more salient. Climate change is a more salient issue than fucking critical race theory or Mr. Potato Head getting canceled or becoming gender neutral. I don't know what the argument even is anymore. It's been too long, but that's what we have to work on. Uh, but having said that though, at times when we see these propagandists fail and their propaganda fails, they don't know how to defend their point of view. And we have to use that to our advantage. And I'll leave that there. I think that most reasonable people acknowledge that things right now in the United States are really, really bad. Things are bad because everyone knows that we have a government that is corrupt to its core and is fundamentally incapable of delivering even the bare minimum for its citizens. So things are bad. And as a result, people are losing faith in the American system, they're losing faith in democracy because they feel as if democracy itself is no longer an effective way to affect political change. So sentiment towards democracy logically is going to shift. Support for democracy will break down as people feel as if it's not working for them because at the end of the day, people care about putting food on the table. They care about themselves more so than the political system that has failed them. Now, I knew that this was the case, but I didn't know how bad it was until I saw it quantified. So a new poll that just came out, it really does a temperature check of where Americans are at with regard to their support for democracy. And wow, is this a wake up call or should this be a wake up call? Because we know that, you know, when things are bad, when times are tough, people are going to be desperate and that desperation leads them to be susceptible to radicalization and to be prone to think in conspiratorial ways. But to see how bad it's gotten, which this poll uh, conveys, it's honestly just, it's shocking and it really spells doom for American democracy. And if this this holds and things don't change soon. American democracy is not long for this world, and that's not hyperbole. So as Reed Wilson of The Hill explains, the poll found about 3 in 10 Americans, 31% believe the 2020 election was stolen from Trump, including two-thirds of Republicans and a whopping 82% of those who trust Fox News more than any other media outlet. Among those who trust far-right outlets like One America News Network and Newsmax, 97% say they believe the election, which even Trump Trump's own cybersecurity and election security officials agreed was the safest and most secure ever conducted in the United States was stolen. One in five Americans believe in the core tenet of the QAnon conspiracy that there is a storm coming soon, while one in six believe the United States government is controlled by a group of Satan-worshipping pedophiles who run a global child sex trafficking ring. The same share, 18%, say they agree with the statement that America has gotten so far off track that true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save our country. The poll found 30% of Republicans agree that violence might be warranted compared with 70% percent of independents and 11 percent of democrats those who buy into the farthest right media outlets are even more likely to contemplate violence among those people 40 percent agree quote i'm not an alarmist by nature but i'm deeply disturbed by these numbers i think that we really have to take them seriously as a threat to democracy said robert jones the founder and chief executive of the public religion research institute 
Now, the PRRI, the Public Religion Research Institute, they're the company that conducted this poll. And like I, I suspected the numbers to be pretty uh, startling. But to see how many people are contemplating violence, how many people believe absurd conspiracy theories, how many people believe that the last election was stolen, it's just... <sighs> We're, we're getting really close to the point of no return, where faith in democracy can't be restored. And you have an entire group of people in America, a substantial portion of the population, saying, we don't support democracy, we support a military coup. We want regime change, literally. Not just a turnover between administrations. We want regime change. And that's incredibly, incredibly horrifying. So this is depressing, but I do want to give you a little bit of hope because we were here before where Americans were very desperate and they started to become fascistic. Literally, they supported Nazis and things were turned around. And the way that that happened was the government restored trust in American democracy and American institutions by delivering to these people. If you deliver and improve the lives of these people materially, that's not going to solve all of the problems. They're not just going to suddenly stop thinking conspiratorially like that. But it is the bare minimum that we can do to address the situation. But really, we have evidence that if we deliver, it works. The problem is that Democrats aren't using this limited window that they have to deliver and actually turn things around. Now, in an article for the Daily Poster, David Zerota explains how the last time things actually were turned around for the better when American democracy was experiencing a legitimacy crisis. So this is what he writes. The first democratic parable began almost 90 years ago when America's economy was ravaged by rampant speculation and then a stock market crash throwing tens of millions of people into abject poverty. As fascism rose in America, through the growth of local Nazi groups, Father Coughlin and other conservative media voices, Franklin Roosevelt cast his progressive economic initiatives as both a weapon to fight the economic crisis and a shield against right-wing authoritarianism. The year before a fulminating Nazi rally in a packed Madison Square Garden in New York, FDR warned that the global rise of fascism was the result of democratic governments doing the opposite of the New Deal and protecting an economic status quo, enriching a tiny handful at the expense of everyone else. Democracy has disappeared in several other great nations, not because the people of those nations disliked democracy, but because they had grown tired of unemployment and insecurity of seeing their children hungry while they sat helpless in the face of government confusion and government weakness through lack of leadership, he said in a 1938 radio address. Finally, in desperation, they chose to sacrifice liberty in the hope of getting something to eat. Now, to be honest, the reforms that FTR implemented were not perfect. Um, in fact, far from it. They excluded black and brown people. They didn't go nearly far enough, but they were enough to save democracy, to literally restore faith back in democracy. And on top of that, it saved capitalism from collapsing in on itself. Now, I think that Joe Biden understands the gravity of the situation. He knows we're in a similar situation, which is why we got these weird puff pieces talking about how Joe Biden wants to be the next FDR. But the problem is that he's not. And he's very clearly not even trying to deliver to the extent that FDR delivered. The answer is to go further than FDR, complete his vision, and include everyone in these New Deal reforms. But that's not happening. And the result will be catastrophic. In fact, if things aren't turned around, this is likely going to be the outcome of the Democratic Party's failures. If Americans keep using democratic institutions to try to fix the country and those institutions keep ignoring them and prioritizing big donors, many voters may simply stop believing in democracy. At minimum, protecting democracy might not be much of a motivating force compelling people to turn out at the polls. So what we're seeing right now is a breakdown of American democracy and Democrats aren't doing what they need to do to address that threat. And the scary part is that they're not going to likely have another opportunity to fix the failures and the deficiencies in our democracy for a really long time. They haven't passed voting rights reform. They haven't done uh, electoral reform. And at a minimum, stop gerrymandering, allow nonpartisan uh, groups to draw district lines. They haven't done that. And so the result is possibly catastrophic. We're heading 
off of a cliff and we desperately need intervention and Democrats aren't doing that. And yes, it's Republicans who are working their voters into a frenzy and they're the ones that have disproportionately lost faith in American democracy because they've been led astray by, you know, us charlatans like Donald Trump and uh, right-wing media. But young people, they're also going to start losing faith in democracy if they don't think their government is going to address the needs that will give them a future. Climate change is not being addressed in a meaningful way. Young people, I mean, it's hard enough to get them to pay attention to politics and get them to vote. So they may be another group that checks out. And here's the thing. You hear me talk about this, and it sounds like I'm catastrophizing, and I am catastrophizing. I think this is important, but some people might think, you know what? I actually think this is a good thing. I believe in this accelerationist theory that out of the rubble of the American empire, something new and possibly better can emerge. And sure, maybe that's possible. But given the population in America, knowing how manipulated we are as a society— what do you think is more likely to happen if American democracy collapses and we actually have regime change in the United States? Do you think we're going to have this compassionate social society where we finally take care of people? Or do you think that we're going to become a reactionary, fascistic, authoritarian society? I think the latter is much more probable than the former, unfortunately. So what we have to do is save democracy and it seems like democrats aren't up for the challenge things might just be too bad to fix and we see the result of that so i don't really have a rosy takeaway here but things have got to change and if they don't people will continue to lose faith in american democracy and the situation will get even worse than it is right now well, folks, we had some really important elections take place tonight, and I wanted to get to the results. Um, I think that you already know, if you're watching this video, that it wasn't a great night for Democrats or progressives. And the race that I was watching the closest was the mayoral race in Buffalo, New York, between India Walton and Byron Brown, which in theory should have been over when she defeated him in a Democratic Party primary, but as you all know, he launched a sore loser writing campaign. So we learned the results of that race tonight. But first, I want to get to the gubernatorial race in Virginia, because the ramifications for that are pretty broad. It sends a huge message about the Democratic Party and how it's looking come 2022, and not good. Because in the race between Terry McAuliffe, the Democrat, and Glenn Youngkin, the Trump Republican, well, it's been called for Glenn Youngkin, who narrowly defeated Terry McAuliffe, and he did not run a substantive campaign. It was all culture war nonsense, uh, critical race theory this, cancel culture that, and it was enough. He elevated the salience of those non-issues in voters' minds because the Democrat didn't run a substantive campaign. This is a corporate Democrat who's an ally with the Clintons. Terry McAuliffe was a governor of Virginia before, and I guess that Democrats didn't have anyone else to put up. And um, the Democrat lost because not enough people were inspired, perhaps in that race, or just nationally by Democrats, because look at what's going on right now. But you're not going to be surprised to learn that um, it's the left who's being blamed for Terry McAuliffe's loss. Heather Cagle tweets out, Dem members are already texting me blaming progressives for debacle in Virginia. And Blake Hounshell tweets out, Some in Biden land are already asking themselves if the president has allowed himself to be tugged too far to the left while in office, and those voices are likely to get louder now. So of course, when all else fails, blame the left. It's their fault, not the fault of the corporate Democrat. Now, it's not just the left who's getting blamed, because on MSNBC, according to Chip Gibbons, they are blaming uh, increasing likely Democratic loss in Virginia on Biden withdrawing from Afghanistan. <laughs> so, I mean, it just, you see so many weird rationalizations here. None of them are based on policy substance whatsoever. I do want to get to demographics here, because as Crystal Ball says, the wine mom giveth and the wine mom taketh away. Because as Sahil Kapoor tweets out, Virginia in 2020, white women, 50% voted for Biden, 49% for Trump. But 
But in 2021, white women went for Yunkin, 57% to 43%. That's a 15-point swing to the GOP in this group. So that's just a small hint of what we can expect in 2022. If there's already this big of a swing in at least this one state, I am expecting a bloodbath for Democrats in 2022. So they should use this time very wisely. Make sure they do uh, electoral reform in the form of uh, banning partisan gerrymandering. Make sure you do voting rights reform. They're not going to do that. And as a result, they're going to get wiped out. And Trump is likely going to win again in 2024. But before I get too ahead of myself, I do want to get to the race in Buffalo. So when it comes to third party candidates and write in campaigns, they usually don't win because we have a first past the post winner take all majoritarian electoral system. And once you win a primary, if the district leans in your party's direction, you're going to win. So I think that it was reasonable to assume that India Walton was the favorite to win. The problem is that in this sore loser write-in campaign that Byron Brown ran, his campaign was funded by Republican donors. He had big money on his side. And guess what? Even if he was running a write-in campaign, it paid off because it looks as if Byron Brown is going to defeat India Walton 59 to 41%. Now, at the time that I record this, the race has yet to be called. There's still uh, less than 70% of precincts reporting. Uh, so I'll post the final results if I have it by the time this video goes up. But this proves that this notion of Democratic Party unity is a fucking sham. It goes one way. And that's not in progressives' favor. Unity means if a progressive loses in a Democratic Party primary, you shut the fuck up, fall in line, and endorse the progressive uh, or endorse the uh, person who beat the progressive. But when uh, the corporate Democrat loses, it's fine. You don't have to uh, try to unify everyone. You don't have to rally support for the opponent who beat you. You can run a sore loser campaign and take Republican money and win somehow. It's sad because this isn't just about Buffalo, in my view. I think we desperately need a leader, a national leader to, leader to emerge on the left. And India Walton was someone who I viewed with potential. But now it appears as if it's over. I don't know what happens next. I hope that she stays engaged and maybe she runs for Congress or something. But Byron Brown ran a write-in campaign and he defeated India Walton. It goes to show you that with big money, anything is possible, even overcoming our electoral system, which is a two-party slanted system. So I can't pretend as if I'm surprised because I knew that the deck was stacked against India Walton, even if this is a write-in campaign. He had a catchy slogan, write down Brown, and he had money, most importantly. But on top of that, to see the way that corporate Democrats and Democratic Party loyalists will deflect when it comes to the gubernatorial race in uh, Virginia. <sighs> I mean, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to be like super exasperated and flustered because I knew that this would be the case. Again, whenever it's convenient, they're going to blame us um, and they're going to come to the wrong conclusion, even if they don't blame us. They're going to assume that maybe they uh, moved too far to the left or wasn't uh, corporatist enough or, or didn't lean into the culture war issues, and also condemn critical race theory in our schools. Either way, uh, this is really bleak shit, but it's it's kind of predictable. Uh, we live in a system that is fundamentally broken to its core, and things just continue to get worse. And even when we have a small opportunity to fix some of the issues, Democrats completely bungle it. And this shows that voters aren't enthusiastic about what they're doing. I think that this, in a way, is a temperature check for how, you know, uh, voters, more broadly speaking, feel about the Democratic Party nationally. And Joe Biden should see this as a wake-up call, but odds are he probably won't. So either way, um, I'm going to try to not let this get me too down, even though I think it's inevitable the more that I think about it, but I'm going to try to distract myself. And I encourage you to to do the same as well, because, you know, it's... <laughs> It's America, right? So you can always expect the dumbest thing to be the likely outcome. And that was the case here in both of these races.
Last week, we got really positive news when it comes to the fight to restore net neutrality at the FCC. But this week, unfortunately, and I'm so sorry that I have to do this, I'm going to have to rain on your parade because it seems likely that things might take a turn for the worse. Not only because Republicans are going to fight to stop, you know, Jessica Rosenworcel and Gigi Stone from getting confirmed, but because they might have some likely allies in Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, because of course. So for the breakdown here, we go to Politico's John Handel, who explains Republicans are lining up against one of President Joe Biden's long-awaited picks for the Federal Communications Commission, which means the outcome of this White House priority could come down once again to Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. At stake are Democrats' hopes for a majority on the five-member FCC, which has been mired in a 2-2 partisan split for all of Biden's term. That in turn will determine whether the agency can get to work on progressives telecom priorities including a revival of the agency's obama era net neutrality rules if the senate fails to act by the end of the year republicans will end up holding the fcc's majority in january even if democrats nominally remain in charge it's yet another example of the endless roadblocks democrats are encountering despite their control of the white house and congress in addition to their struggles in passing an infrastructure bill or meeting their promises on climate change taxes paid leave and health care biden ended months of suspense last week by announcing two Democratic picks for the FCC, nominating Chair Jessica Rosenworcel for a new five-year term on the commission and net neutrality activist Gigi Sohn to fill its open seat. Republican senators largely said they can live with Rosenworcel, but GOP leaders say they're drawing the line at Sohn and her perceived regulatory bent, and they're not on board with the Democrats' push to rush the confirmations through. So they're willing to give Biden Jessica Rosenworcel, who is great, but when you compare Jessica Rosenworcel to Gigi Sohn, Gigi Sohn very clearly has much bigger ambition. She's much more open and firebrand about her support for a free and open internet. And she also wants to regulate, uh, you know, data restrictions. You know, uh, she wants to do a lot. And these Republicans who are bankrolled by the telecom industry, they don't want that to happen. Now, it's possible that Biden can still get both of these appointments through before the end of the year. But that would require zero defections. And when you consider the fact that you have Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, who has previously publicly denounced net neutrality, it seems unlikely. While the two West Virginia and Arizona Democrats are on record as backing Rosenworcel, neither has said a word yet on Sohn, a former top advisor at the Obama-era FCC and co-founder of advocacy group Public Knowledge said. Cinema has historically joined Republicans in fights over FCC policies, including opposing net neutrality. So to reiterate what the article is saying, you know, we have a unique opportunity to restore the FCC uh, the rules that were pro-net neutrality back to what they were before the shill Ajit Pai got in and dismantled it all at the behest of his former employer, Verizon. And now that's all kind of up in limbo because once again, Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin, Republicans have made it very clear. They're not going to support Gigi Sohn. So will Kirsten Cinema, an opponent to net neutrality, and Joe Manchin support Gigi Sohn? It depends. It depends on whether or not their uh, donors at Verizon, Comcast, and AT&T got into their ear. And I'm going to go ahead and guess that that is the case because they're lobbying hard against both Jessica Rosenworcel and Gigi Sohn. But when it comes to Gigi Sohn, they're sounding the alarms. So Ajit Pai's legacy might actually be preserved after all, even having a Democratic administration because of corporate Democrats like Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin. It's just, it's truly um, frustrating, right? If Joe Manchin, or excuse me, Joe Biden had a spine, he would actually be trying to hold these two accountable. Now, we don't know yet, so this is all speculation. But assuming that they fight Gigi Sohn's confirmation, this is the fault of Joe Biden. I mean, he supports net neutrality, so if he wants it, he has to fight for it. And we've seen time and again, Joe Biden just, he can't not be weak, right? Anything that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema says, anything that they demand, they get it. He capitulates. 
And I think that he really enjoys them being the rotating villain. He enjoys that they're out there to take the brunt of the backlash from progressives. But the buck stops with Biden. He is the president of the United States. If he wants something from his party, he should be able to get it. At least more than more often than not. But that hasn't been the case. So I don't know how this is going to turn out, but just a quick update. It's a little bit um, bleak right now, but we'll have to wait and see. But certainly, um, you know, there needs to be grassroots effort and enthusiasm around getting Gigi Sohn confirmed because it seems like Jessica Wilson more so is a possibility. But that still doesn't matter if at, at the end of the day, the FCC is deadlocked 2 2 and they can't restore net neutrality. So we have to get Gigi Sohn confirmed. And um, we'll just have to wait and see for now. But this is kind of a little bit of a roadblock. And that's extremely disappointing. My friends, if we're to recognize that a better, more hopeful future of every nation has to do its part with ambitious targets to keep 1.5 degrees in reach and specific plans of how to get there, especially the major economies, it's imperative that we support developing nations so they can be our partners in this effort. Right now, we're still falling short. There's no more time to hang back or sit in the fence or argue amongst ourselves. This is the challenge of our collective lifetimes, the existential threat, threat to human existence as we know it. And every day we delay, the cost of inaction increases. So let this be the moment that we answer history's call here in Glasgow. Let this be the start of a decade of transformative action that preserves our planet and raises the quality of life for people everywhere. We can do this. We just have to make a choice to do it. That was President Joe Biden speaking at the UN Climate Change Conference, otherwise known as COP26, which is indeed taking place this week. And his speech was fine, I guess. I just can't help but feel a little bit deflated because no matter what these world leaders say, they're not taking climate change seriously. They say the right thing, but then they don't do the right thing. They don't address this crisis with the severity that is needed. And so it just feels like all of their speeches is intended to placate climate change activists, just make it seem as if they're trying to do what's needed when they're not. And that's not to say that there haven't been good things that have come out of this at this point in time. I think that there's a really solid commitment from the Biden administration. Uh, he joined the High Ambition Coalition, which is an alliance of countries that are committed to keeping warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is very ambitious. That's what's needed to stop catastrophic levels of climate change, as unlikely as that goal may be. But while we have, you know, some countries like the United States do more this time around in comparison to when Donald Trump was president, you have other countries like Australia under the leadership of the Morrison government refuse to cut methane emissions and even host a fossil fuel company at its pavilion. So it just, it, it feels like, this time, you know, the U.S. might be on point while Australia is fumbling. But in a couple of years, when there's changes in leadership, we'll have a Republican administration and then they're the ones fumbling and Australia does better. I mean, regardless, it's very clear to me that global capitalism has led to all of these world leaders and world powers dragging their feet. And even if they continue to say the right thing, it's to the point where we have to see real action. Otherwise, we're all going to die. I mean, that's, to be frank, to be blunt, I don't know what the world is going to look like when I'm the age of these world leaders. Am I going to anticipate, or should I anticipate uh, wars over water? Should I anticipate increased global fascism because of the refugee crises that is going to inevitably result when areas of the globe are uninhabitable and we see mass movement of people. I don't know what the fuck to expect. So it's my future that I want them to care about. And they say that they do, but it feels like they don't. And apparently me feeling ambivalent, I'm not alone because there were a lot of activists that were heckling these world leaders. And that was honestly really refreshing to see. Because they're not treating it like the crisis that it is. And, you know, maybe it's the case that I'm being a little bit too cynical, but apparently a lot of climate activists feel the same way. And here's some videos of them 
uh, protesting these world leaders, not necessarily protesting, but trying to get the word out that what they're doing is not sufficient. And there's a message from an activist there that says exactly what uh, I think that these world leaders need to hear. Shame on you! 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 Here to protest to raise awareness of the the need for urgent action on the climate and ecological emergency um, mostly because with our political processes we're left with almost no other routes to, to make a difference like what do I do as an individual to try to make sure that our world leaders choose to save our own lives we're going down an utterly absurd route of deciding as a species to kill ourselves and we have to step up and say no that's completely absurd let's choose a route that saves ourselves and protesting seems to be the only effective way to do that um, so I'm here doing my best to uh, to make my voice heard. I guess I'm here because I think it's important that the decision makers know that people care um, so we need to make some noise, make sure they know that we're watching, we're listening, we're holding them to account for the decisions that they're making um, so that we're working towards global justice, climate justice and not just making the decisions that only benefit a few people but rather to make decisions that benefit everyone. That video gave me hope because when I think about the ramifications of climate change, oftentimes I kind of get in my own head and it feels like I'm the only one was dealing with it, but it reminded me that we're all dealing with this together. This isn't something that we're facing um, that's a unique issue. We're all, as a species, dealing with it, and young people are going to be particularly frustrated. And something that uh, that guy said, it stood out to me, he said, we're going down the utterly absurd route of deciding as a species to kill ourselves. And that's just it. I mean, we as a species are insane. We're suicidal. The reluctance of world leaders to address this meaningfully, it speaks to a defect in our species as human beings that we just, we don't, we don't care about the species. We, we think about the short term and in particular short term profits of the fossil fuel industry who funds a lot of these world governments uh, or governments who are uh, world leaders. And it's just, it's frustrating. Now, as distraught as young people may be, Nobody is going to experience climate change quite like island countries. And so the president of Palau had a really, really powerful speech that I, that I think everyone needs to see, where he talked about what world leaders, what developed countries are doing to island uh, nations like Palau. The Palau legend of Wab illustrates our state of emergency. Wab was a boy who grew into a giant that wouldn't stop growing. Due to his unruly appetite, the whole island community was forced to feed him. Wab's feeding depleted all the natural resources and finally threatened, he threatened to eat his people. To save themselves, the villagers banded together, took bold action, and set fire to him. This is eerily reminiscent of today's world, as large emitters, with their insatiable appetite, for advancement are continuing to abuse our environment, threatening our very survival. COP26 must light the fire. We, the islands that are devastated most, demand that your commitments of 100 billion annually be increased to meet the $4 trillion the World Bank reports is needed. We, See, the scorching sun is giving us intolerable heat. The warming sea is invading us. The strong winds are blowing us every which way. Our resources are disappearing before our eyes, and our future is being robbed from us. 
Frankly speaking, there is no dignity to a slow and painful death. You might as well bomb our islands instead of making us suffer only to witness our slow and fateful demise. Leaders of the G20, we are drowning, and our only hope is the life ring you are holding. You must act now. We must act together. As we say in our Palawan chant, it says, when traveling in one canoe, the score among the sailors will capsize the boat. The chant reminds us that we need to deliver on our commitments and we must move in unison toward 1.5 to stay alive. The villagers burned the giant Wap, and as he fell to his death, he created over 300 islands of our islands. Bold, unified action led to transformation. We must act together. We owe this to each other, and we owe this to our children. I mean, it doesn't get any more blunt and bleak, to be clear, than that. You might as well bomb our islands instead of making us suffer only to witness our slow demise. So, you know, I see this and I'm hopeful because people are not taking, you know, these mere concessions from politicians anymore. They're standing up and they're demanding action on climate change now. And that's something that is relatively new. There's always been environmental activism. There's always been a lot of people who speak up with regard to climate change and climate catastrophe. But now more people than ever are waking up to the fact that we might not have a future. We might not have a habitable planet if we don't take action right now in this decade. We have a limited window to act and world leaders just aren't doing enough. And the fact that people acknowledge that and are putting pressure on these world leaders as they gather, that does mean something to me. So as doomer as I may feel when I watch these speeches, and again, Joe Biden's speech wasn't bad. I mean, it's better than a Trump speech on climate change where he just denies the existence of anthropogenic climate change. But I want more than words. In fact, I need more than words. As a species, we need more than words. Because you can say the right thing, but at the end of the day, if you don't do what's needed to save the planet, you're no different than the climate change deniers, at least substantively. So I'll leave that there. COP26 took place. I just thought you should know. Wanted to provide you with some highlights. So I didn't know about this story. I'm a little bit late to the party on this, but I had to talk about this after reading an article about it because... I mean, I, I don't really even know what to say. There are no words to describe how absurd this story is. So for those of you who don't know, QAnon is indeed still a thing. It doesn't matter that countless prophecies from Q have not come to fruition. There's still a lot of people, thousands of people across the country and even people internationally who buy into QAnon. But they believed that, um, or there's a portion of QAnon believers that subscribe to this idea that JFK Jr. is uh, still alive, even though he's been dead since 1999. And uh, he's not only alive, but he's going to reveal himself to the public again, and he will announce a joint presidential run with Donald Trump in 2024, and he will be Donald Trump's running mate. That's what lots of people believe, literally thousands of people believe and you're going to get a sense of how many people believed it with the story because the reporter showed up and the crowd here waiting for jfk jr to reveal himself it really makes me lose hope not just in american society but in humanity more broadly speaking so reporter steven monticelli reported on this event and he says there is currently a large crowd of what appears to be QAnon believers at the AT&T Discovery Plaza in downtown Dallas. A popular QAnon theory recently is that JFK Jr. of the Kennedy family will be making a big announcement at Dealey Plaza by the Grassy Knoll sometime tomorrow. Now, if you expand both of these photos, you can see that this is a fairly large crowd considering how absurd this conspiracy theory is. And you can see, sure enough, multiple people have on Trump Kennedy 2024 shirts now i have this morbid curiosity here i want to pick their brain but also i don't want to do that because i'm horrified at what might 
lie in the depths of their fucking psyches. It, it just to think that Trump and JFK Jr. are going to run together in 2024. It's so delusional that I, I think that it's as delusional if you thought that Trump and the Tooth Fairy were going to run together. He's been dead for decades, and you think that he's going to make himself known again? Now, if you're curious, they're not thinking that he's going to reveal himself in ghost form. They think that his death was a false flag. So they think he's still alive, and maybe he's chilling on an island somewhere with Tupac. I don't know. But here's some additional details from uh, Stephen Monticelli. So he later showed up to the main event and writes, Update, I just got to Dealey Plaza. We'll be contributing to an article about the gathering for the Daily Beast. Keep an eye out for it today. Crowd is now significantly larger as we get closer to the time when JFK Jr. will ostensibly make his announcement. Having some great conversations out here. Oh boy. <laughs> 12 minutes until the big reveal. And you see that crowd, right? Now, spoiler alert, JFK Jr. never showed up. Because guess what? He's dead. He's been dead for a very long time. But that photo of the crowd that you saw, um, it's just a really tiny snapshot of the overall picture. So I'm going to play some video clips that Steven shared. And he kind of pans back and forth, and you can see how big this crowd is. And this is a lot of people that believe this batshit fucking insane thing. All these people showed up to see a dead man announce a presidential run with Donald Trump. Take a look. Let's go, Brandon! Let's go, Brandon! It is almost 12.29. Any minute now, the big reveal. The crowd is big, ready to go. Don't tell nothing but the truth to help them die. Or should they help them say, Let's go back this. Let's, Let's go, go fake news. news. Let's <laughs> yeah. No, he's with the media, especially on TV, he's media in the country. So you know, when you got one control over that, it's like what? We got a troll over there. We got a troll. Did, did we land on the moon? No. Did we land on the moon? No. That is a massive crowd of people, considering what they were there for. They expected a dead man to announce that he's been alive all this time and he's running for president with Donald Trump. Now, this idea that uh, JFK Jr.'s death was a false flag, it's been circulated in conspiracy uh, in QAnon groups since 2018, I believe. But there's also a portion of QAnon followers that believe that JFK Jr. is actually Q. He's the one who's been giving them all of these prophecies, none of which have bared out, but this is what they believe. I mean, look, part of me wants to laugh, right? Because when people believe something so absurd, so ridiculous, you can't not just think that they're goofy, think that they're unserious. But it's also really depressing and really sad. If this is where we're at in the United States, how do we ever progress as a society, we have a portion of the population who thinks the 2020 election was stolen. We have a portion of the population who believes that JFK Jr. is still alive and he's running in 2024 with Donald Trump. And it doesn't matter how many times Q's prophecies are uh, disproven, they still follow this shit. How do we go forward as a society? Like, this really should force us to be introspective because these people are lost, and I don't know if we can save them from themselves. I don't know if we can ever bring them out of this conspiracy hole that they've dug for themselves. I, I just, I don't know what to do. Seeing this makes me feel uh, like we're just so fucking lost beyond and broken beyond repair in, in America. That many fucking people, hundreds of people, traveled there, traveled to Dallas to see a dead man make an announcement about the 2024 election. That is insanity. 
That is fucking insane. And at this point, we are so beyond what uh, the stupidity level was in the movie Idiocracy that I wouldn't be surprised if you told me that there were a portion of QAnon followers that thought that Santa Claus was going to run for election in 2028. I, I just, I wouldn't be faced by it. Throw anything at me and I'm not going to be faced. You can tell me that fucking QAnon believers think that eating shit, eating dog shit is literally a cure for COVID. And I think, oh, okay, yeah, that's probably not the craziest thing that I've heard. It's just, I don't, I don't know where the, uh, the bottom is, right? My expectations are to the floor and they keep getting lowered below the floor. So I just, uh, we're reaching the earth's core at this point with regards to my expectations. I don't know what to say. It's sad. And I laughed initially at the story, but upon further reflection, I feel genuinely depressed by this because these people are so fucking stupid. And I mean, sure, you can blame institutions, blame socioeconomic status, blame them, uh, or blame you know the media for not educating people, blame the American education system for not teaching people just basic critical thinking and logic. But at the end of the day, if you are an adult, you have to bear some responsibility for what you believe and what you choose to consume. And it's clear that these people are consuming media that is rotting their fucking brains. And the prevalence of this, you know, I, I don't know how many people overall believe in this, but if they don't believe in this conspiracy theory, they believe in another conspiracy theory about the vaccines or about the moon landing, as was shown there. It's just really sad to see. We are a broken society. And uh, I just, I feel like the thought of repairing this society is <laughs> is impossible. I, I don't know. But yeah, that many people think that JFK Jr. is going to be running with Trump in 2024. Okay. Lauren Boebert is probably one of, if not the dumbest members of Congress. And I say that well aware of the fact that people like Louis Gohmert exist, and I know that they exist. But even compared to Louis Gohmert, I mean, she's giving him a run for his money. And this is someone who I genuinely think is stupid. And you might view that as an ad hominem, but I genuinely think that she has a low IQ and that she's unintelligent. And if you're not convinced, I mean, let me give you a couple more facts. Uh, she is a member of QAnon. She actually subscribed at least at some point to the QAnon conspiracy theory. On top of that, she conspired with January 6th insurrectionists. So this person is, is very stupid. And it seems like she's almost in a competition with her colleagues to be viewed nationally as the dumbest member of Congress. And I'm sure that when you ask her, she thinks she's smarter than everyone else. But I, I just got to give you a couple of examples that demonstrate how dense this person is just from lately. So she tweeted about climate activist Greta Thunberg, and she tries to attack Greta by saying, uh, tell me you have absolutely no idea why you're protesting without telling me you have absolutely no idea what you're protesting. Now, it's a really quick clip that we're going to play, but let's see if we could try to decode this very cryptic message from climate activist Greta Thunberg. No more exploitation of people and nature and the planet. No more exploitation. No more blah, blah, blah. No more whatever the fuck they're doing inside there. <laughs> If you have an issue understanding what she was saying there, even without the context, that says more about you than it does about her, Lauren. I think it's clear that she is calling on leaders at the UN Climate Change Conference to take action. Stop using flowery words, stop trying to placate climate activists, and actually do what is needed to save the planet. If you don't get that that's what she's trying to say, I mean, I can't, I can't help you there. Maybe... This issue is just too big for your comprehension. Uh, but there's another issue that she decided to weigh in on, and that is the paternity leave debate that's all of a sudden being turned into a cultural issue by the right. Either way, she weighed in, and undoubtedly, after everyone has already spoken about this, Tucker Carlson, Joe Rogan, she came through with the dumbest take imaginable. I mean, this is a hot take, and it's laughably stupid. Mayor Pete was on a two-month maternity 
paternity, whatever the heck you want to call it, leave. The guy was gone, okay? The guy was not working. Because why? He was trying to figure out how to chest feed. Maybe someone should tell him, please, so he can get back to work. Listen, I'm a mother of four. I delivered one of my children in the front seat of my truck. Because as a mom of four, we got things to do. Ain't nobody got time for two and a half months of maternity leave. We have a world to save here. You've got a world to save from climate change? What? Uh, of course, communism. That's what we're saving the world from, I'd assume. Communism. That was just embarrassing. That was really embarrassing. She bragged about this. I'm a mother of four. I delivered one of my children in the front seat of my truck. Now, you'd think upon hearing that story, man, that's, that's really tragic. Did you not have medical insurance? Were you not able to make it to the hospital in time? What's, what's the backstory? Uh, well, it's because as a mom of four, we've got things to do. Ain't nobody got time for two and a half months of maternity leave. So because you're busy, you decided to just pop the child out in the front seat of your truck. I don't understand. W what are you even trying to get at here? Lots of people have things to do. But if you're literally delivering a child and you purposefully delivered your baby in the front seat of your truck because quote unquote, ain't nobody got time to take time off, you're a fucking moron. And I don't believe that she delivered the baby in the front seat of her truck because she was short on time. I, I just don't believe that. And if you think that people delivering their babies uh, in the fronts of trucks and getting quickly back to work is like some virtuous thing that we should celebrate as a society, no, it actually speaks to the barbarity of America. Aren't you supposed to be a pro-life person, by the way? I mean, isn't paternity and maternity leave a pro-life policy? Don't you think that if you are pro-family, you would encourage parents to take the time to take care of their babies and get to know their babies? I just, this is so stupid. People are busy, so they're just like popping those fucking babies out. They're flying out, literally, and um, somebody's catching it, and then they're getting right back to work. That's the way it works. And I love how that's their counter to pro-family policies. This is the Family Values Party, but yet their response to a policy that's extremely popular is to counter by saying, ain't nobody got time for that. They'll recite a meme from 2013 before they actually put up a legitimate counter argument to paternity and maternity leave. And for her, I mean, of course she had to throw in homophobia. Oh, well, you know, maybe Pete Buttigieg is taking all that time off because he's trying to figure out how to chest feed. We get it because you're, you're gay and you can't have babies, LOL. Okay, point taken. Except I think that you know why he's taking time off because it's important that you spend this time bonding with your children. I just, look, I hate Pete Buttigieg and I don't like this story because it's making me have to in a roundabout way, defend Pete Buttigieg, even though I'm really defending paternity leave itself, but they can't not show their true colors, the homophobia, the stupidity, them promoting barbarity in our system. Oh, well, you know what? This is just the way it is. We don't have time for maternity leave. I don't have time to take time off because I'm busy, uh, you know, serving the capitalist overlords. And she's like a business owner, right? So she was getting back to work at her own restaurant that she owns and runs. But for the average working person, taking time off is actually very valuable and necessary, especially when you have a fucking child. But if you're Lauren Boebert, pop that fucker out and get right back to work, peasant. I mean, this is, this is a rising star in one of two major parties in the United States. Long story short, folks, we are fucking doomed because dipshits like this are going to continue to get elevated to positions of power and influence. And you heard it here, folks. She thinks that ain't nobody got time for maternity leave. What a fucking <laughs> imbecile. It's almost funny. She's, she's so insufferable. Hi, folks. I'm here with Imani Oakley running in New Jersey's 10th congressional district, and she is here to talk about her campaign. Imani, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you. It's been a difficult week for leftists, and hopefully you can help us cope with um, everything that's going on and everything that is seemingly going wrong. Uh, you're running a fantastic campaign. Your platform is just incredible. 
what made you want to run for Congress? Uh, because there's seemingly infinite things that need to be fixed. So it seems like a really hard task if you were to even get elected. What made you want to run? Yeah. So, I mean, anybody that knows me knows that, you know, for the longest, pretty much throughout my entire adult career, I have always fought against unjust systems, uh, whether that's unjust systems of policing, unjust systems of uh, bad drug policy laws, unjust systems of racism, sexism, you name it, you know, that's what I've dedicated my adult career to. And when I first started working in Jersey politics, I actually worked under what is known as the machine. And I got in, I was wet behind the ears, and I was just like ready to make some transformative change. That's why I got into it. And the more I stuck around, the more and more I realized how absolutely corrupt they were, um, how they have actually manipulated the democracy in New Jersey via New Jersey's corrupt ballot design in order to make sure that their machine bat candidates constantly win. I saw how they used our neighborhoods as essentially financial and political playgrounds for uh, Democratic Party bosses. Um, New Jersey actually has a Tammany Hall machine style of politics where there are actual party bosses that people have to go to and get permission to run for office, get permission to do pretty much anything politically. Wow. Um, and I saw how all of that was playing out and I was very much against it. It was very much against my values. And so I decided to run against the machine and I certainly plan on beating them come June 2022. So I like that you you saw how bad it was. And rather than leaning into it because you are a moral person with principles, you decided, no, I want to fight this. Now, knowing how the machine crushes candidates like you who are grassroots, you know, non-corporate funded, uh, what do you think is the best insight that you have for politicians everywhere going up against the machine, knowing the way that it works? Because once you've seen how the sausage is made, you're grossed out by it. But a lot of people kind of get allured and sometimes co-opted. So what's your advice to other people? And what do you think is the main thing that helps you be effective at beating the machine? Yeah, yeah. So number one, I would say do not get into public service if you don't have a strong foundation of values. Uh, from what I've noticed, the people who kind of get swept up in the machine life are folks who come in, they think politics is kind of cool, but they're more in love with the power and kind of the... Um, the clout that they get from being involved in politics more than they are in love with the actual work. So if you want to stick to your values or you want to like continue to be a good non-corrupt person, do not go into public life until you have a firm set of values. I think that's ultimately what saved me. It's like, I was like, these are values that I'm not deviating from. We should have a good democracy. Black and brown communities should not be used as financial and political playgrounds. Like these were things that were solidly part of my foundation of morals. Uh, and so I wasn't corrupted. But I've seen other people kind of get shaken because they're in love with the power more than they are with the actual good work that can be done through government. Um, and, you know, uh, that's the advice I would have. But I would also say each state is unique. Each machine is unique. Like New Jersey has unique pressure points that I'm very familiar with because I used to work for them. Um, I both worked for them and I've worked against them. So I am very familiar with all the pressure points, which allows me to really succeed in a lot of ways. Um, and I think anybody can do that no matter where they are in the country. You have to learn the power players. You have to learn what makes them tick. And then you have to apply pressure to those pressure points. And we can break this thing. We can really break machines. And that's why I really respect you as a candidate, because so many people would acknowledge that even if they don't like what they see, once they kind of are part of that club, for lack of a better word, it, they know that it's easier to go along to get along. Mm -hmm. So even if you might not like it, it's easier to just kind of shut up and let them do their thing. But you fighting against it, it really gives me hope because I don't think a lot of people have that moral character. And that's kind of the problem with D.C. politics. Uh, some people who are elected, even if they have the right policies, they don't necessarily have the correct diagnosis of the system. And one way to kind of um, demonstrate that is the uh, ongoing negotiations with Build Back Better and the bipartisan infrastructure, which I'm sure that all of my viewers and you're tired of hearing about at this point. But I, I think that one thing that's really missing is the way that corruption comes into play. Um, you know, you see people talking about the hypocrisy of Joe Manchin holding up the entire Democratic Party's agenda. He said he wants four trillion in January, and now he, he wants less than two trillion. But I think that the core 
thing that's missing missing is uh, this conversation about corruption. You know, the way that he takes money from the fossil fuel industry, the way that Kirsten Cinema takes money from uh, big pharmaceutical companies. So in DC, assuming you're elected, what would you do to really shine a spotlight on that? Because I think that a lot of Americans have a sense of the way that politicians get corrupted by big money, but they don't necessarily know. And I think it's a matter of connecting the dots. I'm not sure if you agree with that. So how would you bring this to the forefront um, as a representative and you know, um, as someone who's going to be calling out your colleagues, how do you think you would deal with that, knowing that they might kind of try to push you aside once, once you're in D.C.? Yeah. So for one, you know, I haven't been taking money from corporate PACs. We actually outraised my opponent two to one last financial quarter only on low dollar individual donations. Um, and that's not going to change once I get to Congress. Once I get to Congress, I'm not going to all of a sudden be like, well, I'm here going to take some PAC money. <laughs> uh, so corporate PAC money, you know, that's not going to happen. So that's one way to avoid getting corrupted is making sure that you run on those values and then stick to those values of not taking corporate PAC money once you are actually elected. Um, as far as pushing colleagues, you know, I think that it takes kind of a twofold thing going on here. It one, making sure that I maintain my relationships with those outside organizers and organizations that really are um, pushing, they aren't working from the inside of Congress, but actually pushing Congress to do things, making sure that I'm still working with them, still helping them get a platform, still you know showing up to their rallies and making sure that their voices are still amplified via the power of my office. But then it's also, when this is going to be really, really critical, we have to get our numbers up in 2022 because you can really, you know, do all the right things when it comes to keeping contacts with orgs. You can do all the right things within Congress as far as showing up to committee and, you know, testifying the right way. But we need the numbers. We absolutely need the numbers. And I know folks are tired. I know, especially in Jersey, where we've just it just been seemingly like back to back to back elections. But we really need to come out and making sure we're doing all that we can for progressive candidates this time so we can have build our numbers up and we can really do some damage um, and have actual power once we're in Congress. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that you brought that up because a lot of people are feeling beat down, especially after this week. We just had the catastrophic loss in Buffalo, New York with India Walton, and some uh, someone that, you know, I was really rooting for and following on this program. We had the loss in Virginia, which I don't necessarily feel too invested in. But, it, you know, we see how the left is getting blamed um, at a time where I, I think a lot of people, especially seeing the way that the Build Back Better negotiations have gone, feel kind of like they're ready to check out of politics mm -hmm. and knowing that grassroots candidates such as yourself really rely on enthusiasm and what you lack in corporate donations you make up for in grassroots support. How do you keep people engaged? Like, what's your advice to people who are usually enthusiastic, but they just feel beat down by the system and feel like there's never going to be changed? Like, what would you tell that person? Because this is something that I kind of struggle with myself in terms of trying to keep people motivated. Yeah, well, I mean, as dark as this is about to sound, uh, you know, the way we're looking at things here in New Jersey is that we smell blood in the water. Um, essentially, what happened here in Jersey is a bunch of machine Democrats took some serious losses or are very, very close to possibly taking a loss. And everything that we can point to shows that it's their own fault. It's their own fault in the way they structured our corrupt ballot design. It's their own fault in the way they've actually chosen candidates in the past and chosen more people who are lackluster and not actually star candidates because they can be what they call loyal, which means they're just a yes mm -hmm. person. Um, and it's coming back because What's happening is Republicans are putting up their quote unquote best people, um, meaning they're like not best values wise, but best politicians against some very lackluster talent. And it's showing in New Jersey. And, you know, all the progressive folks in New Jersey are seeing it. Um, and so I think, you know, even though we've taken this loss, now is the time to really hunker down in our values to shine that light on the things that establishment and machine Democrats have done that have absolutely screwed us over and really drive that point home and show them that we're not going to continue to lose to conservatives and Republicans simply because they have an agenda for their own personal power. Um, so that's what we're doing here in Jersey. And so far, like folks are ready. I can, I can already feel the energy folks are gearing up for June 7th, 2022.
That's great. That's really, really great to hear. Uh, I wanted to ask you, because we don't necessarily know what the landscape will be be like next year. Um, if you're elected, you'll be sworn in in 2023. Um, so we don't know if Democrats will still hang on to control of the House. But hypothetically speaking, if you were in Congress right now, um, what would be your take? Uh, would you do anything differently than congressional progressives, members of the squad? What do you think they're doing right? And what do you think they're doing wrong with regard to the Build Back Better Act negotiations? Yeah, so I mean, I think they're doing the best they can. Again, it's, it's all about numbers. And I think they've actually done a good job in actually proving a point here. And what we've been seeing is that progressives have actually legitimately you know, been trying to work with Biden. And I know that, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of puts progressive policies back a little bit because, you know, we are more to the left of Biden. But essentially, they've done a great job of proving the point that the problem isn't progressives. The problem are these centrists like Manchin, Cinema, Gottheimer. Those are the folks that are actually obstructing change and actually blocking people from getting real things done and helping real people in this country. So I actually think they've done a great job at proving that point. Um, I think the, the one thing that, you know, and, and again, maybe this is just my bias as a candidate, but I also think that, you know, progressives need to support progressives. Um, and not to say that they're not doing that, but, you know, we're reaching out to folks looking for endorsements. I'm hoping that, you know, those star progressives that are in there can start endorsing a lot more because that helps to build momentum. And again, not saying that anyone's not doing this necessarily, um, but I'm just saying if I were there, that's kind of what I would be pushing for is to like making sure I'm getting out those endorsements and help just kind of corralling folks for these elections. Um, and again, there's a difference between what you do politically and then what you do like actually in Congress and when you're doing policy. But I think right now it's time to really turn on the, the burners, switch gears a little bit and really, really push to get that progressive wave. Because we've only got like a few months before a lot of these races start getting down to the wire and getting down to election day. And we need the numbers. Like I cannot emphasize how much of a difference it would make if we boosted our numbers. Yeah, I think you're bringing up really important points. I, I think that one, if I could critique members of the squad, I, I do think that they capitulate too much to leadership. But one thing that's also missing is this connection between the organizations that help them get elected. And to an extent, they still do work with leaders of organizations like Sunrise and whatnot. But you, you still kind of feel that connection in a way was severed. Um, and also on top of that, I feel like they need to do more to endorse candidates. So it's nice to know that if you were elected, you would endorse up and comers because, you know, whether it's a matter of them not doing enough to fight Democratic Party leadership and caving too soon, everyone admits and knows that it would be so much better if there were more progressives in Congress. And I think that they really could do more to endorse people such as yourself, who are very truly like galvanating people in your district. And I think that's so important. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask you is uh, where you'd stand on the Build Back Better Act. So we don't necessarily know what it's going to look like in the end. Um, but there is the infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better Act. So as a member of the House Congressional Progressive Caucus, which I'd assume you would be, um, what would happen in the event the Senate didn't vote on the Build Back Better Act, mm -hmm. but they expected you to vote on the bipartisan infrastructure deal first? Mm -hmm. Now, knowing this, you'd kind of give away your leverage, at least temporarily, maybe you secure a promise from Joe Biden. Um, what would you do in that situation? Because knowing that if you vote for this, mm -hmm. Manchin holds all the cards. Mm -hmm. But yet Joe Biden is saying, do it. Pramila Jayapal is saying, I have the votes, vote for it. What do you as an individual lawmaker do in that instance? Yeah, so in that instance, I would make a kind of calculation, you know, what? how many more folks get damaged if I don't vote for it? versus if I hold back and say, oh, no, I'm gonna hold the line a bit here and fight this out a little bit more. I think it would really depend on like what the situation is on the ground and like how dire people need even just like the smallest amount of, of help. Because, you know, a lot of times these bills, when progressives like are pushing them, they can help like just like tons and tons and tons of people, then the centrists get it and it gets whittled down to significantly less people, but it still mm -hmm. ends up being thousands of people, right? So I think I would end up making a calculation of like, all right, 
how many people actually need something to be delivered today? Like we just actually need to get this done today versus like, uh, can I hold the line a bit more? And in holding the line, can I also push members? Cause it's not about just like holding the line and like, there's no kind of push or demand there because that doesn't, doesn't really help anyone. Um, but is there a way to say like, get people in somebody who is a centrist getting folks to call their office? Are they in an election year? Can I get their constituents to bombard their office with phone calls saying, we will absolutely not vote for you unless you give us something good, right? Like, so there, there are little tactics and I think it depends on really what the situation is at the time when I'm in there. But broadly speaking, that would be my calculation. So you know, okay. how many people need it like right now versus like, can I hold the line a little bit longer? And then also like, what are my avenues to apply pressure to those who are really trying to um, you know, make the bill essentially worth this? Okay. Okay. I want to ask you another hypothetical question because I think that these are really useful for kind of gauging how candidates would uh, legislate and govern because you're inevitably going to be put in really difficult predicaments as a lawmaker and as a progressive, you know, they're going to try to test um, your patience and, you know, your your moral fortitude. I think it's, it's basically inevitable. So uh, one thing that you mentioned that I love is that you would endorse uh, outsider candidates who are running these insurgent primary campaigns. So let's say that you have this really, really key issue for you, a bill that you've introduced, and it's starting to actually gain momentum. You have committee hearings for it, and you're missing some really key co-sponsors here. Now, one member noticed that you might be endorsing their primary opponent. But yet, this is also someone who could potentially co-sponsor your legislation. Mm -hmm. In that predicament, in the event they said, hi, Imani, um, I really want to support your bill, but I don't know that I can work with you if you're going to be endorsing my primary opponent. I, I just don't know that there's this long-term relationship. Uh, maybe I'll change my mind if you withhold your endorsement. Mm -hmm. What do you do in that situation? Because this is a really tough thing that I think that a lot of members of Congress who are progressive are going to have to deal with. I feel like this is what happened with AOC and Cori Bush uh, back in 2020 when she kind of withheld her endorsement for Cori Bush because Lacey Clay, Cori Bush's opponent at the time, was co-sponsoring her Green New Deal resolution. So what would you do in this instance? I just kind of want to see the way that you would like um, cal make this calculation and think it through. Yeah, so I promise I am not trying to avoid your question. But what I will say is I would not be in that predicament because I would keep it very close to vest on who I'm endorsing. Um, mm. So again, I'm tr I'm really not trying to avoid your question, uh, but like essentially the other members would not know. I keep it very very close to vest. Uh, my team has been very good at keeping things close to vest generally throughout this campaign, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. So I would keep it close to vest, um, and people wouldn't be able to tell until I did it. Um, so that's that's number one. Um, then also just being you know strategic and smart about like you know who can I kind of tolerate being around because they will sign on to certain bills versus like who has got to go like tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like for example, my opponent right. has to go like tomorrow. He has the third lowest attendance rate out of all of Democrats. So like, even if you wanted him to sign on to something, he's not there. So right. best of luck. Um, so, you know, I would also be very, very strategic in like making sure that whoever I'm endorsing, it's like, you know, you, you kind of got to go for us to get anything done. Uh, but I would also keep it close to best so that folks really wouldn't know. Um, until the time came. Interesting, interesting. Um, okay, so you kind of touched on this. Tell me more about your opponent, um, because I, I think that this is really important to draw these uh, contrasts. You are a million times better than your opponent. And I think that when we talk about corporate Democrats, people kind of get a sense, but really explain, like put it into uh, perspective for us. Why is your opponent so bad? Why do you feel like your opponent needs to go right now and why this is so important? Yeah, absolutely. So my opponent is one of those members of Congress who inherited the seat from their dad. Um, so we've got a political dynasty going on, which of course we want to get rid of all of those. Yes. Um, he's been in the seat for 10 years. Like I said, he has the third lowest attendance rate among all de Democrats and one of the lowest attendance rates amongst all members of Congress. So he's not even going to work for the people of the district. On top of that, he has taken money from some of the worst actors out there. He has taken thousands of dollars from ExxonMobil. He has taken thousands of dollars from several oil pipeline packs, including Enbridge, which is uh, responsible wow. for the Line 3 oil pipeline. 
He's taken thousands of dollars from Amazon, who right now, as we speak, is trying to build a secret hub in this district, in New Jersey's 10th district, that will add significant amount of pollutants to the air um, in uh, Newark, where there are considerable black and brown residents who already have some of the highest rates of childhood asthma in the nation in the nation. And this guy's taking tens of thousands of dollars from those folks. Okay. He's taking tens of thousands of dollars from the realtors pack that is currently fighting right now to stop uh, Elizabeth Warren and Cori Bush's eviction moratorium bill. Um, and this is also a district that has some really big issues with housing stability. As of 2019, we were number one in the nation for foreclosures still, even after the wow. housing we have constantly rising rent that is pushing gentrification, pushing homelessness. Like it's a real, housing is a real issue here. And for him to be taking money from those folks, it's just a slap in the face to the constituents of, of this district. Um, on top of that, there are currently around 15 bills right now that are sitting in, um, the, the, in Congress that focus on LGBTQ plus rights. And a lot of these bills are really important. Like one of them bans the use of the really torturous fracture of conversion therapy. Uh, and nearly every single member of the New Jersey delegation is signed on to at least two or three of these bills, including Trump Republican Jeff Van Drew. My opponent is not signed on to one of those 15 bills. And in fact, it was that he wasn't signed on to 16 of them. Then we criticized him both in the papers here in New Jersey and on social media. And then all of a sudden he found it in his heart to sign on to one of the 15. Um, mm. So again, this is a guy that I like to call someone who aids and abets the pub Republican agenda. Because the fact that you're not signing on to legislation that is this simple, protecting LGBTQ plus rights, very simple, very easy to do, especially in your deep blue district. Um, you know, that's a guy that that needs to go. He is not working for the people of this district. Um, and he's, he's somebody who, frankly, I think aid and abets the Republican agenda. Yeah, I, I mean, it's like with Democrats like this, who needs Republicans, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's so infuriating. I mean, we're talking about the bare minimum. And, you know, the one thing that I think about uh, with Democrats is that usually, at least rhetorically speaking, they're better on social issues, LGBTQ plus issues. So if you can't even do that, if you're not willing to be economically progressive, then you better really deliver when it comes to social issues. Yeah. And if you can't even do that, I, I just feel like, what is the point of you even being there? But as you said, I mean, this is a dynasty. Um, he's there because... You know, uh, it, it's it's a it comes down to privilege. What I wanted to ask you about this is kind of a, a different subject. Is uh, it feels like the difference between progressives like yourself and uh, corporate Democrats? The differences are so wide now. It feels weird that we're all having to share this party. Like it's this unholy alliance, but because we have this really antiquated two party duopoly system, it's like you have to run in one of the two major parties in order to win. If you're elected, would you be open to co-sponsoring legislation like HR 4000? It hasn't been reintroduced yet, but what this would do is it would move us towards a multi-party system. Um, it's not a guarantee that this legislation would create multiple parties that are viable, but it would end gerrymandering. It would um, make us more proportional. Would you support some Something like that, because I feel like the way that our current government is structured, even though money is the core issue that's kind of corrupting everything, I think that having more parties would also help. So would you be open to something like that? Yeah, I'm open for anything that gives us more democracy. Anything right. that can give us a better and improved democracy, I am for. Again, coming up in a state where democracy is really quite manipulated um, yeah. and corrupt with regards to our ballot design, which is literally the most corrupt ballot design in the entire country. We are literally the only state that uses it. Um, and there have been studies by um, nonprofits as well as professors that have talked about why our ballot design is so screwed up. Um, and there's also a court case going on right now where um, mm. candidates are actually suing over this ballot design, say, stating that it's unconstitutional. Um, and so coming up in a state like that, where we have real problems with democracy, democracy is something that is very important to me. No matter where I'm landing as far as my party affiliation, I do believe that people People should have the choice in a democracy to choose what party they should they want to run as, choose what party they want to vote for, and that should be open and free to every one of us. So I am open to anything that gives us more democracy.
That's great. Yeah, that, that's perfect. And with your perspective, like from your state, um, that that definitely makes sense. I've seen the ballots from New Jersey and it is mind boggling to me. I don't know how like how people deal with that because it's so confusing. You know, it's stressful enough filling out a ballot. I live in Oregon, so we get our ballots mailed to us. And that is a very long, like two hour process where I look up each ballot initiative. And so to make the ballot itself more complicated, I, I feel like that is a form of voter suppression. So it's it, I'm glad that, you know, you're shining a light on this and people from New Jersey leftists um, are shining a light on this. So I feel like at this point in time, all of my viewers, they're already sold on you. It's just a matter of how do we help you get elected? So what is it that you need from us? Do you need donations? Do you need uh, canvassers, phone bankers? We want you in Congress. How do we make this happen? Yes. Yeah, so there are two ways. So the first way, of course, are those small dollar donations. If you can, please go to Oakley, F-O-R, Congress. So that's Oakley for Congress. Dot com. You're going to see a pop-up. Please, please donate 25, 50, 100 if you can spare it, 250 or more because we are not taking money from corporate PACs and my opponent certainly is. Right now, the, the momentum is in our direction. We outraised him two to one, but we can't do it just once. We got to keep doing it all the way through election day. So please go to Oakley for Congress dot com and drop us a donation. The second way is if you can't give a donation right now, it's just a little bit out of your uh, purview at the moment, please go to again, oakleyforcongress.com. Look at the top navigation bar. You're going to see a button that says volunteer. Click that button, sign up to volunteer because we definitely need folks to help us phone bank. If you're in Jersey, we need help canvassing. So we do need those volunteers and those boots on the grounds and uh, ears on the phone. So again, that's Oakley. F-O-R-Congress.com. Please go and donate, sign up to volunteer. We would love to have your help. Well, Imani, I am absolutely rooting for you. I'm sure we will follow your campaign and bring you back on at some point, hopefully when you actually win. Yes. But uh, either way, thank you so much for just staying engaged. I know it's really difficult right now to even think about politics, but the fact that you're running and making this self-sacrifice, I really appreciate it. I know that my viewers do too. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. All right, folks, that is everything. Thank you all so much for watching. If you've made it this far in the program, as usual, we're not going to go anywhere without thanking the people who make this show possible. All of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members for helping us not just to survive, but thrive as well. I truly appreciate all of you. Um, I know that sometimes politics can get really draining and depressing. And, you know, if you if you check out, I think that that's acceptable. Allowing yourself time to recover from this absolutely depressing cycle of news is natural and healthy at times. So don't feel bad if you check out. I sometimes have to check out and force myself to not pay attention to politics over the weekend. But, you know, regardless, I will be here when you decide to come back because the stories just aren't getting any rosier. But you know what? It is what it is, and uh, we'll just keep pushing through it. Anyways, I'll see you all next week. My name is Mike Figueredo. I don't even know how the fuck to pronounce my own name. My name is Mike Figueredo. I'll see you all next week. Take care, everyone.